record. Okay, and then apply theories and models in different conflict situation, which is case study. Kalau kita sempat untuk tengok case study nanti, identify conflict analysis model and approaches. Okay, identify causes and implication of conflict according to different types of conflict analysis models and approaches. Okay, so sebenarnya, uh, siapa yang dah sini, yang dah attend uh, class theory in HRD? How many of you already attended the theory class by uh, Associate Professor Dr. Siti Rabaah Hamza? Dah attend belum? Belum, Prof. Ini, eh, belum nak tahu kita orang SEM 1. SEM 1, okay. So, teori ni, siapa ada siapa-siapa tahu apa tu teori? Kenapa akademik, orang akademik ni sangat suka teori ni? Kalau attend kelas orang akademik, mesti ada teori. Kenapa teori ni? Tahu tak kenapa? Ada ada anybody? Okay, teori ni adalah satu panduan Okey dia tak panduan umum tentang sesuatu fenomena. Okey dia menerangkan dia memberi penjelasan umum itu provide general explanations regarding a certain phenomenon a particular phenomenon. Okey contohnya kalau berlakunya hujan so dia akan bagi uh, dia akan bagi tahu macam mana berlakunya hujan. Okey kalau contoh nak berlakunya work employee engagement. Okey penglibatan pekerja di tempat kerja so dia akan explain macam mana uh, uh, penglibatan kerja tu boleh berlaku di tempat kerja dan sama juga dalam dalam konteks konflik so teori ni akan menerangkan secara umum macam mana konflik tu boleh berlaku dan bagaimana kita boleh menguruskan konflik itu fungsi teori sebab tu orang akademik ni sangat suka dengan teori ni sebab daripada teori itulah kita dapat idea macam mana kita nak menyelesaikan sesuatu isu tu okey So then model ni pula, uh, uh, conflict analysis model ni pula dia adalah model, dia adalah macam satu gambar raja ataupun proses yang boleh digunakan sebagai panduan. Yang ni dia lebih spesifik berbanding uh, teori. Okay, model ni dia lebih spesifik. Okay, ta tapi daripada segi applicability dia kita lagi prefer teori sebab nak come out dengan teori tu, you need to test a few models uh, for several times. Okay, bila dah solid, model tu barulah dia akan jadi teori. Okay, so ni yang kita cuba belajar hari ni. Okay, so uh, these are the few, conf, uh, these are a few uh, of conflict management theories available in literature. So kita ada critical theory, feminist theory, postmodernism or uh, dia ada modernism and postmodernism theory. Okay. Uh, post uh, structural and post structural theory colonial and post colonial theory okay. so kita saya akan kenalkan you all nampak lima tapi sebenarnya ada lagi uh, versus versus tu kat sini okey so kita start dengan critical theory so teori ni sebenarnya eh uh, dia sebenarnya berasal daripada pergerakan-pergerakan movement uh, pada era-era tersebut okey movement pembebasan ke dia 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 start daripada situ. So that's why teori ni dia boleh dikatakan sebagai ideologi juga. Fahaman-fahaman yang dibawa yang dibawa oleh penggerak-penggerak uh, time tu, masa tu. Okay. So contoh critical teori ni dia dipraktis by Frankfurt School theoreticians. For example, Herbert Marcus, Theodore Adorn and so Adorno and so on. Okay, dia teori critical teori ni asal dia adalah daripada Karl Marx. Karl Marx asal dia dia punya pelopor dia. Okey, Marxism tu. Okey, dia emerge as a means to support marginalized groups in attaining their societal goals. So kalau kita tengok sejarah dulu eh, so uh, in which sistem kita ni dia berkasta. Okey, dia berkasta. Dia ada yang satu puak mendominasi uh, ekonomi negara dan satu puak lagi yang tertindas. Adalah puak yang kat tengah-tengah tu Tapi dia akan ada itulah struktur dia pada zaman dulu Dan struktur tu sebenarnya ada lagi zaman kini Tapi dia punya uh, The way it looks tu probably different from uh, From apa tu 50 years ago, 100 years ago Tapi ada di beberapa negara dia masih lagi wujud Contohnya di Thailand, the system monarchy Monarchy system in Thailand Ataupun sistem kasta di India Ada lagi Okay, so sebab tu Okay uh, 
critical theory ni ataupun fahaman critical ni diwujudkan sebab dia nak fight for the marginalized group. Marginalized group time tu kita anggap dia adalah contohnya African American, group yang tertindas. Okay, Native American. Okay, Malaysia as a multiracial country, macam kita pun ada juga di Malaysia pun ada juga kumpulan-kumpulan uh, tertentu yang belum mendapat hak yang sama rata. Okay, and then lagi contoh adalah women ataupun kalau kat Malaysia ni ada juga contohnya orang asli, kes orang asli. Uh, ataupun uh, those uh, stay in Sabah and Sarawak, Kadazan contohnya. Okay, so involve assessment and critic of society and culture to reveal and challenge power structure. So by the name critical theory ni, dia propose critical thinking. Okay, dia nak propose supaya orang yang membawa fahaman kritikal ni dia sentiasa mengkritik. Okay, dari segi power structure, struktur power di sesebuah kawasan ataupun di sesebuah negara. Okay, ne kritik ni bukan saja kita suka-suka nak kritik, bukan. Okay, kita mengkritik untuk membawa kepada uh, equality. Okay, they fight, they try to fight for equality for the marginalized group. Okay, so it refers to any theory belief that is seek to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. Okay, and then aim to achieve a just, rational, human and reconciled society through critical analysis of the social and political environment prevailing in society. Contohnya, kalau kita tengok isu orang asli, kenapa dia susah nak dapat hak pendidikan, contohnya nak dapat kota pendidikan ataupun nak dapat beasiswa, contohnya. So, dia akan, so kita akan buat analisis uh, struktur mana daripada negara ni sebenarnya yang uh, menghalang uh, orang asli ni untuk uh, untuk uh, mendapat hak yang sama dalam pendidikan, contoh. Uh, eh, itu contoh. And then, uh, it has been dealing with a range of issues such as government policy. Uh, so, kita kena tengok bila kita analisis, uh, kita nak menaikkan taraf contohnya uh, hak hak orang-orang asli ni, so kita kena tengok balik the review of policy. So meaning that there should be someone who brave enough to critic the government policy. Ha, nak critic ni kena ada medium dia lah, kat mana sama ada dalam berita ke, okay, dalam penulisan ke, okay, and then attitudes of individuals and group. Ha, contohnya kita bawakan dia ada movement ataupun group, ha, tubuhkan persatuan untuk kita fight for the, uh, the the orang asli's right. Okay, and then discrimination and rights of the oppressed. Okay, and then challenges. Uh, last time, discrimination and rights of the oppressed ni including women. Uh, eh, last time, kita nak dapatkan hak hak pendidikan untuk uh, untuk golongan wanita ni pun susah. Contoh, uh, golongan lelaki ada juga dia part yang tertindas dia. Okay, tapi ni contoh yang dulu. Okay, and then and challenges related to the creation of social balance between the personal autonomy of individuals and the universal solidarity of collective. Okay, so its orientation is towards critically analyzing the issues related to oppression and discrimination by capitalism. So, dia punya asal dia lah, orientasi asal dia adalah dia nak critically uh, critically critic about the operation and discrimination by capitalist. Capitalist ni maksudnya orang yang mengawal ekonomi. Okey, dia nak dia nak kritik supaya the structure tu dia akan di di di, di diseimbangkan dengan golongan-golongan miskin ni. Okey. So kalau ikut Gill, Gill 1998 ni dia kata operation ni refers to a mode of human relations involving domination and exploitation. Sebab bila kita kita tahu kapitalis ni dia akan exploit, dia akan dominate the the economy dan dia akan exploit the manpower. Ha dia buat dia kawal, dia kawal di peringkat atas. Okey dan dia akan exploit the manpower ni including dia dia bagi Uh, apa tu low uh, wage contohnya dekat pekerja ataupun tak bagi gaji uh, itu exploitation okay so including social and psychology between individuals between social groups and classes within and beyond society and globally and then between entire societies itu maksud oppression okay the second one is injustice okay refers to coercively establish and maintain inequalities discrimination and Uh, uh, dehumanizing or de uh, development inhibiting condition of living for example slavery 
exploitative wage labor, unemployment, poverty, starvation and homeless and so on. Uh, so, uh, critical theory ni, dia cuba theoretical theory ataupun orang-orang yang uh, bergerak mengikut fahaman critical ni, dia cuba fight untuk dua benda ni, oppression and injustice. Okay, oppression, ketidakadilan yang wujud dalam kita punya sistem sosial. Okay. Sebenarnya dia punya fahaman ni dulu dia start macam saya kata dia start dengan uh, operation and discrimination by capitalism. Tapi sekarang ni dia wujud lagi. Tapi dia punya uh, dia punya um, uh, motif asal tu berubahlah sebab dia nak fight for the marginalized group, not only uh, the operation and discrimination by capitalism. Sebab ada negara yang dia dah tak amalkan capitalism dah. Okay, cuma uh, mungkin ada group uh, macam contoh saya sebut tadi grup uh, apa tu orang asli yang masih tak mendapat hak yang sepatutnya. Okay. Next one adalah feminist theory. Uh, so feminist theory ni by the name it's very clear lah eh. It try uh, it fighting for the women's right ataupun feminist right. Uh, so tapi sebenarnya teori ni dia bukan sahaja fight for women's right eh. So ada yang golongan-golongan uh, yang berfahaman feminist ni they also fight for LGBT. Contoh, I'm not sure uh, is there anybody of you that also support the LGBT lah. Tapi inilah salah satu fahaman yang dibawa. Okay, they believe that everybody should uh, should have the equal opportunity. Doesn't matter dia punya what is their uh, gender orientation and so on. Okay. So just to let you know eh, uh, saya tak tahu uh, how many of you support the LGBT and so on but I just let you know. Okay, uh, I talk most of religion in Malaysia. We 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 do not uh, we do not bukan kata tak terima lah. Uh, ni we do not we still do not accept that the LGBT tu supposed to live lah. Okay, supposed to have to supposed to exist bukan supposed to live. Okay, because uh, by nature kita dah ada gender kita masing-masing. But just to let you know, in literature eh, when you go through the, the literature, it is very difficult to find a definition of gender ni according to kita punya intimate uh, in, uh, kita punya intimate macam cuma contoh penis penis ataupun uh, vagina tak ada definition tu unless you you refer to the literature dekat Madsen uh, semua definition on gender ni dia highlight on the orientation orientation ni means that what is the intention the gender intention that you want to be kita punya intention. Tak kira lah walaupun kita ada penis. Tapi kalau let's say kita punya intention niat kita kita nak jadi perempuan then we are women. Walaupun kita ada vagina. Tapi kalau intention kita, orientation kita adalah towards nak jadi lelaki. Dan kita lelaki. Okay itu maksud dia. So that you have to be very careful lah bila you all tengok definition ni. Okay cuma saya explain. Okay, ada yang memang fighting for the feminist ni. Tapi kalau dulu feminist uh, move, uh, apa movers ni, golongan-golongan feminist ni, they are trying to fight for women's rights. Sebab apa? Sebab zaman dulu, around 50 years or 100 years ago, um, semua kita punya sistem pentadbiran ni dipelopori oleh golongan lelaki. Okay, golongan lelaki lah eh. So kalau contoh, kalau you are present uh, in Arab, contohnya negara-negara Arab, Uh, only few years back sahaja yang women di uh, women di uh, allowed to drive on road uh, baru beberapa tahun lepas sebelum ni perempuan langsung diharamkan memandu di jalan raya uh, kalau di negara-negara Arab hanya dalam beberapa tahun lepas sahaja baru da, baru diberi kebenaran okey sama juga dalam hak-hak pendidikan kalau kita tengok you all tengok cerita-cerita cerita Korea ataupun cerita-cerita Chinese yang zaman Ming dynasty Ming and so on in which women are not allowed to uh, to attend uh, to 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 uh, obtain similar education or uh, education opportunity as men uh, sebab itulah uh, uh, apa tu uh, fahaman ni diwujudkan sebab nak fight for women's right okay so feminist scholarship, uh, scholarship in conflict resolution eh, has included at least one element though often some combination of several from the listing below Okay, the critics of the absence and of uh, and or marginalization of women in the field and an effort to include women and to make women visible and heard. 
Okay, the current effort eh, uh, untuk uh, untuk di, uh, contoh di Malaysia and eh, the current effort to bring women forward adalah dalam bentuk uh, parliament representation. Uh, eh. So, kalau kita tengok lagi satu adalah uh, represent, women representation in board, executive board. Contohnya dalam private, uh, di private industry, private uh, uh, sector eh. Rarely found women to be uh, representative Uh, uh, a representative in board dalam dalam board uh, uh, apa tu uh, organisasi susah sangat kita nak dapat even kita tengok among the managers pun uh, less number of women compared to men kadang-kadang ada 10 seorang je perempuan uh, representative in board ni sama juga dalam parlimen so sekarang ni uh, tapi kalau dalam uh, dari uh, uh, government sector kita dah achieve the 30, uh, 35% tu 35% yang targeted by the government government last time 35% uh, women representative in board for government sector tapi for uh, private sector we are still fighting for it okay and then articulation of a unique feminist standpoint for approaching peacemaking Uh, and conflict resolution which is essentially different to and qualitatively better than mainstream or male stream perspective okay so sebel, uh, macam saya kata tadi before the industrial revolution eh before the industrial revolution most of the industry has been conquered by male so meaning that the system uh, the working environment uh, the work system work structure work, uh, performance evaluation has been shaped according to men perspective men perspective eh ha, tapi yang lelaki jangan ingat saya feminis pula ha, eh kita just fight for the right tapi saya bukanlah fahaman uh, feminis cuma saya menerangkan sahaja okey so maksudnya working environment kita ni has been shaped according to men perspective contohnya uh, kerusi kita Ha, kerusi tempat kita duduk tu dia sesuai untuk badan lelaki bukan sesuai untuk badan perempuan okey and then barang-barang yang diangkut contohnya proses kerja semua disesuaikan dengan lelaki sebab masa dulu memang lelaki adalah orang yang yang bekerja the only breadwinner of the family ha, sebab tu semua tu disesuaikan dengan lelaki okey tapi dengan uh, dengan uh, adanya pertambahan bilangan wanita yang memasuki labor market so therefore kita nak highlight yang there is a necessity for the government or, or for the workplace to adapt with that changes uh, maksudnya that's why lepas tu kita start ada maternity leave untuk suitkan dengan package-package benefit yang ada di kat organisasi ni dengan pekerja wanita eh Uh, last time kita tak ada paternity leave tapi nowadays dah ada sebab apa sebab there is a need for men for the uh, for the father to take care of the uh, of the wife bila wife dia uh, melahirkan ha uh, itu dia ada adaptation sikit eh okay and then feminist theorization of difference in critical uh, in critical theory and practice okay dia ada sikit perbezaan dengan critical theory in which it, uh, it challenge to essentialism intersection power and privilege and culture dia ada sikitlah perbezaan dengan critical theory and then feminist redefinition of central concepts in the field especially violence power peace and security sebab tu saya kata tadi feminist theory ni dibangunkan sebab dia dibangunkan base dia adalah untuk fighting for women's rights sebab itulah dia ada dia selalu menekankan perkataan violence ni okey sebab women is seen as someone as inferior Inferior ni orang yang lemah berbanding dengan lelaki. Inferior. Lelaki ni superior. Okay. So then that's why uh, the chances of women to involve or to 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 involve in domestic violence or any kinds of violence is higher compared to male. Okay. And then power. Power control. Okay. And then peace and security. Okay. And then original feminist research and theorizing including field research in conflict areas design to transform not not merely reform the field. So maksudnya kat sini dia cadangkan research ataupun teori akademik yang berkaitan ni perlu di reform. Reform ni revamp balik dan recreate untuk menggambarkan keadaan sebenar wanita, golongan-golongan feminin. Ha eh, itu maksud dia. Ini penekanan dalam feminist theory. Any question so far? 
Okay, uh, macam saya kata tadi, even though teori ni dah di-establish di lama, tapi kita kena faham yang ada lagi golongan-golongan uh, yang membawa fahaman-fahaman ni. So, kita boleh tengok sekeliling kita dan kita boleh cuba reflect. Okay, inilah fahaman-fahaman yang wujud. Okay, next one kita tengok modernism versus postmodernism. Okay, modernism ni dia adalah uh, refers to enlightenment, uh, assumptions concerning uh, role reason, okay, or rationality or scientific reasoning play in guiding our understanding of the human condition. Okay, modernism ni dia maksudnya bila kita melihat sesuatu, kita just assume yang benda tu adalah objektif. Objektif ni maksudnya hanya ada satu satu cara untuk menyelesaikan sesuatu masalah. Itu modernism. Maksudnya bila kita nak selesaikan sesuatu tu dia based on logical thinking. Ha, dia tak boleh based on something yang fiction. Tak boleh. Ha, itu golongan modernism ni. Maksudnya kalau dia nak membuktikan sesuatu, dia mestilah berdasarkan fakta. Mesti based on logic sahaja. Okay. Postmodernism ni di, uh, dibangunkan untuk Uh, bukan menentang tapi satu idea yang against the modernism ni Sebab kita dunia kita, kita tak boleh translate ataupun interpret hanya melalui satu cara Kan? Sebab contohnya kalau kita nak angkat kerusi Is there just only one way untuk kita move the chair? Ada satu cara je ke kita nak? Ha, right? So it is impossible sebab there are multiple realities bila kita nak, nak nak angkat kursi tu banyak cara sama ada kita pergi angkat atau kita kita guna troli. Okey, banyak kaedah. Okey, so it is illogic to look at things or that to look at only one truth. Satu hanya satu kebenaran tu itu tak logik. Okey, so postmodernism ni so diperkenalkan untuk deny the application of logical thinking as in modernism. Okay, so it based on an uh, unscientific, irrational thought process as a reaction to modernism. Because sometimes it is possible the ideas to move a chain it comes from the the, the irrational uh, apa tu the unscientific ataupun benda yang kita kadang tak terfikir pun. Macam mana kita nak solve the issue, right? Okay, so modernist position ni dia kata scientists scientists have access to a uniquely objective method. Objective method ni sama macam saya kata tadi lah. Okay, dia maksudnya hanya satu cara sahaja untuk menyelesaikan masalah. Itu sahaja. Okay, meanwhile, postmodernist position is said that scholars should reflect on their biases and those of the scholarly community of which they are part. Maksudnya, bila kita nak interpret, bila want a researcher ataupun an individual try to interpret the phenomenon, he or she should also reflect. Okay, the biases. Biases ni can be the gender can be the culture okay can be the background ha, apa lagi yang boleh menyebabkan sesuatu tu dipengaruhi uh, apa tu sesuatu tu ditakrifkan dengan berbeza okay and then it spread the idea through the language and symbol ha, so postmodernism ni dia spread idea dia through uh, through the uh, through language and symbol nanti lagi saya tunjuk okay postmodernism rejects dualistic thinking Ha, dia dualistic thinking ni maksudnya dua benda neutrality and objectivity. Okey, dia tak dia tak tengok sesuatu benda tu sebagai neutral. Dia mesti akan ada bila kita tengok sesuatu tu dia impossible neutral. For sure kita akan ada pandangan kita sendiri. Okey, and then and mega theories of overarching truth and celebrate diversity and conflict. Ha, eh. So ni kalau postmodernism ni dia, dia tak kata dia dia menolak yang hanya ada satu kebenaran dan dia celebrate the diversity kepelbagaian. Okey. Example tak ada yang kat sini. Ha, ni sebenarnya. Uh, this is example of how uh, postmodernism spread dia ideas. I'm not sure who is it. Can you turn off your uh, mic? Yeah, turn off dah. Okay. So this is the example how postmodernism spread their ideas. When you look at the picture, what you can interpret? Apa apa ada bila when you look at the picture? Apa yang you all boleh nampak? Apa yang you all boleh interpret? Is there only one interpretation from the picture? 
Rabu lah doktor. Rabu. Tak, memang ah. gambar ni memang macam ni. Memang gambar ni memang. Oh. Ah, Lukisan-lukisan lilin. Oh. Memang gambar ni macam ni. Ha. So what can you see? Satu jambatan. Ha. Uh -huh. so, dia, apa maksud yang you all boleh interpret from the picture? Ha. Keindahan, ketenangan. Ha. Waktu petang. Sebab nampak macam ada cahaya ni sikit ni. Naik. Apa lagi? Dekat kampung. Dekat bandar. Bandar. Nampak macam bandar doktor. Si? Ha. So every people has their own interpretation. Itu maksud post-modernism. Post Okay, so dia highlightkan kepelbagaian. Okay, maksudnya setiap individu tu unik. Dia ada pandangan dia sendiri. Itu maksud postmodernism eh. Okay, dia tak sama dengan moder, uh, modernism. Modernism ni satu cara je. Bila you all tengok gambar ni, kalau saya kata uh, gambar ni adalah gambar kampung. Uh, itu sahaja. So you all tak boleh nak kata, no doktor, itu bukan gambar kampung. Itu bandar tak boleh. Itu modernism. Satu cara sahaja. Okay, postmodernism ni kita appreciate the diversity. Okay. Next one, structuralism versus post-structuralism. So, structuralism versus uh, dengan post-structuralism ni dia lebih sama dengan, lebih kurang sama dengan modernism and post-modernism. Cuma structure, uh, structuralism yeah. dengan post-structuralism ni, dia highlight more on the structure and power. Struktur tu. Struktur tu maksudnya kalau dalam sistem demokrasi, apa yang kena ada? Sistem birokrasi, apa yang ada? Struktur tu sendiri eh. So, structuralism was an intellectual movement in France in the 1950s and 1960s that studied the underlying structures. Ha, sebab by the name structure tu kita tengok struktur in cultural products. Okay, and use analytical concept from linguistics, psychology, anthropology and other fields to interpret those structure. Okay, so dia sama. Structuralism ni dia sama macam modernism. Structuralism ni dia kata meaning is stable constituted through underlying structure or system. Dia, maksudnya contoh kalau kita kita gunakan sistem birokrasi uh, sistem demokrasi. So dia kata hanya sistem demokrasi sahaja yang betul. So kita tak boleh tukar kepada birokrasi. Ha, tak boleh. Dia satu cara sahaja. Okay. There is a single truth or meaning. There is objective reality. They search for universal truth and rules that govern meaning. Maksud universal truth ni maksudnya they look for they look for uh, a standard that is applicable that they think applicable to everyone contoh ha, contoh yang saya bagi adalah sistem penilaian prestasi dalam organisasi SKT kalau uh, kalau government SKT ha, sistem tu sendiri dia develop sebab apa sebab kita ingat oh, semua orang sama so kita develop sama je setiap orang so untuk semua orang Kalau kita ada satu staff, the way we evaluate our employee tu sama saja. Ha, itu maksud dia the universal truth ni. Ha, one thing that uh, applicable to all. Okay, kalau kita relate dengan design research, ni relate dengan quantitative. Ha, eh, kalau research ni quantitative research. Sebab kita uh, kita finding kita, kita assume it is applicable to all. Kita tak tengok uh, kepada uniqueness of the individual. Okay. Meanwhile, the post-structuralism uh, post ni dia sama macam post-modernism in which it is against the structuralism. So, dia kata meaning is not stable, dependent and dependent on interpreter rather than the structure. Okay, so maksudnya dia kata sesuatu perkara tu berlaku, okay, dia tak ada satu maksud. Dia dia, dia, dia bergantung kepada interpretasi seseorang tu, interpretasi, interpretasi individu. Okay, so there are multiple truths and meaning. Meaning that multiple realities. The only the only reality is constituted through language in our minds. Okay, and then they are interested in differences in truth rather than universal truth. Uh, so, kalau postmodernism ni, they are interested on the diversity, similar as in postmodernism. Kita nak tahu kalau let's say uh, ada wia, ha, ada wia. Contohnya ada wia. Saya nak tahu uh, ada wiyah punya personal uh, opinion regarding my class contohnya. Saya tak nak tahu uh, sama ada sekali saya tanya. Semua suka saya kelas saya tak? Suka. Ha. Saya tak nak tahu tu. Tapi saya nak tahu the individual perspective. Ada yang suka separuh, ada yang mungkin su tak suka langsung pun. 
Ha, tapi kita nak tahu that truth tu. Tu maksud dia eh. Clear so far? Perbandingan critical, postmodernism, modernism, structural and uh, post-structural. Okay, Doktor. Good. Okay, dah. Next one, post-colonial. Uh, post-colonial ni sama dia, kita tengok masa kolonial, apa pandangan orang-orang yang belum dijajah. Dan post-colonial, apa <coughs> dekat orang-orang yang telah dijajah. Okay. So it is related to how colonizing countries deal with colonization or colonized people. So maksudnya contoh kalau dulu masa British menawan tanah Melayu contohnya. Okay. So what they do to the to the uh, tanah Melayu ni. Uh, apa yang dia orang buat time tu? Pemisahan contohnya. Apa yang dia buat? Okay. To control and then probably bila bila seseorang tu decolonize, dijajah. So kita akan ada trauma. So apa yang diorang buat untuk mengatasi trauma yang dialami oleh rakyat-rakyat uh, yang dijajah. Ha, itu maksud dia. Post-colonial theory refers to theoretical and critical observations of former colonies of the western powers and how they relate to and interact with the rest of the world. Ha, macam mana maksudnya bila dia dah jajah sesuatu tempat, macam mana dia justify the colonization tu? Ha, contoh kalau let's say last time dia orang pergi dekat Afghanistan last time. So how they justify the colonization tu. Okay. Greatly interested in the cultures of colonizer and then uh, the colonized uh, and the colonized group. Colonizer orang yang menjajah, colonized orang yang dijajah. Dia nak tahu orang yang uh, penjajah ni apa sebenarnya budaya dia. Penjajah ni mestilah dia nak maintain the power. Sebab they think that they are more superior. And then uh, then kalau kita relate to the current issue that happening in Russia right now. Between Russia and Ukraine. So why Russia nak masuk ke Ukraine tu? Because Russia think that they are more superior compared to Ukraine. Uh, eh? And then six to critically investigate what happens when two cultures clash and one of them ideologically fashions itself as superior and assume dominance and control over the other. Uh, eh? So to, walaupun dia popular in 1970s, tapi sekarang dia masih berlaku. Uh, walaupun colonization ni kita ingat dah, uh, dah tak berlaku lah sebab kita dah ada negara-negara uh, yang berdaulat. Yang, yang dah kita diistiharkan tapi masih lagi berlaku contohnya di Ukraine ataupun juga di Palestin yang uh, tanpa kesudahan lagi tu. Okay? Okay. So far any question sebelum kita masuk kepada conflict analysis? Any question so far? Okay. So next one, this one eh, this one uh, pun memang berkait dengan you all punya assignment. Okay, when you want to do the conflict mapping. Okay, then you need to start with conflict analysis. Okay, so conflict ni sebenarnya dia sama macam kita kita attend training, kita nak buat training, latihan dalam organisasi. When you want to conduct a training, uh, before you conduct a training in your organization, then therefore you need to identify the need among your employee. Then, if let's say you become the practitioner in conflict management, then you need to identify what are the factors related to your uh, to the conflict of your client. Contohnya, okay. So uh, sebenarnya ini conflict uh, conflict uh, practitioners ni ataupun conflict management practitioners ni dia bukan sahaja uh, jawatan tu bukan sahaja dipegang oleh lawyer, uh, peguam, hakim, bukan. But we as, as an HR officer pun, we are responsible as a conflict manager, management practitioner. Kita pun responsible. Sebab daily, kita akan address dengan isu konflik antara pekerja. Okay? So the term conflict assessment is also often used for the process of gaining a deeper understanding and broad overview of the conflict. Okay, and then systematic study of the profile, causes, actors and dynamics direction of conflict. So, conflict analysis ni dia adalah satu kajian sistematik regarding the profiling. Kita nak buat profiling regarding the conflict ni, the causes, actors, okay, siapa pihak yang terlibat dalam konflik tu, the dynamic ni, the dynamic ni referring to the changes. The changes uh, in terms of the direction of the conflict within a certain time period. Okay, in which we seek to identify opportunity for managing or resolving disputes without lead to violent action. 
Seboleh-bolehnya eh when we many when we want to manage a conflict ni we don't want the conflict to be settled uh, uh, through violent action or to be settled in court. Seboleh-bolehnya. We want to settle it individually but through negotiation or mediation as an alternative. We as much as possible we want to avoid the case to be bring to be brought to court. Sebolehnya. Okay. So no one is correct. No one correct method for conflict analysis. Sebenarnya untuk run the conflict analysis ni there are a few methods. Tapi tak ada satu pun yang uh, one model that fit all, that fix all. Okay, so kena, kita kena sebagai practitioner, sebagai expert then kita kena evaluate which model that suit for the specific situation. Okay, and then good and a good analysis leads to uh, successful conflict management. So that's why kita kena betul-betul pilih model ataupun kaedah yang sesuai supaya kita kena pasti benda-benda yang patut dikenal pasti dalam konflik tersebut supaya ianya dapat diselesaikan dengan baik. Okay, so why conflict analysis is essential? Sebab apa dia perlu? Sebab it clarify and prioritize the range of issues that need to be addressed. Okay, dia akan mengutamakan apa sebenarnya isu utama dalam sesuatu konflik. So for example, issue, the divorce issues, the conflict related to divorce. Apa sebenarnya yang diperlukan oleh uh, uh, apa tu, the ex-wife and the ex-husband? Adakah hak penjagaan anak semata-mata ataupun hak sepencarian? Apa sebenarnya yang diperlukan? Okay, so kita kena address betul-betul. Sebab kadang-kadang tuntutan uh, tuntutan hak uh, tuntutan dibuat ke di mahkamah bukan sebab dia nak harta. Uh, tapi bukan sebab setakat dia nak harta hak sepencarian tu. Tapi the feeling of satisfaction when you win the case. You rasa satisfied. Sebenarnya harta tu, duit yang you dapat mungkin tak berbaloi pun dengan the, the payment that you have to pay your lawyer. Tak berbaloi pun. Right? But the satisfaction that you have bila you win the case. Itu yang you, yang itu yang boleh jadi the plaintiff ataupun anak guam nak. Okay. And then identify the impacts of conflict. Uh, through the conflict analysis ni kita tengok either after the conflict ni we can still maintain a long term relationship or not. For example in the case of uh, Siti Nordiana and uh, Lan and the typewriter and the team tu. Uh, let's say the case uh, has been bring to the court, is it possible the two teams ni can maintain their long term relationship? Contoh. Okay, then identify root causes and contributing factors. Lagi satu eh, impact of conflict ni adalah contohnya case um, disputes at, at the workplace contohnya. Kalau the case tu has been brought to uh, labor court contohnya, possible tak pekerja tu still men, bekerja dekat organisasi? Contoh. Ha. Okay. And then identify the root causes and contributing factors of conflict in order to determine appropriate responses. Determine the stakeholders' motivations and incentive through an understanding of their interests, needs and views of the conflict. Maksudnya kita identify. Okay, siapa stakeholder dalam stakeholder ni? Maksudnya uh, parties involved directly or indirect, uh, indirectly with the conflict. So what are their interests ataupun apa benefit yang dia dapat. Contohnya dalam kes saja. Okay, ha, ni saya highlight je kes-kes tertentu eh. Behind sajak ni there are few NGOs. Ha, okay, there are few NGOs. Uh, I do hope that everybody know who is Nur Sajat eh. Bukan Nur Sajat, Muhammad. Muhammad Sajat eh. Okay, I do I do hope that uh, we are discussing the same thing because I'm sure that all, everybody, everyone here are Malaysian students. So, kita rasa, saya rasa kita sentuh isu yang Malaysia senang sikit supaya nampak eh. So dalam kes uh, Muhammad Sajak ni sebenarnya eh, walaupun di depannya kita nampak adalah Muhammad Sajak but behind him okay, there are a lot of NGOs that uh, selain daripada nak uh, uh, that try to fight for the for the justice that they think for Sajak, Muhammad Sajak they are also trying to critic our government policy that still ban the LGBT in Malaysia as what you know or supposed to know LGBT has been accepted in most countries, including Arab countries. Ada sikit je dalam satu dua country saja yang tolak. Uh, so, dia sebenarnya ada NGO yang menyokong tu. So, sebabnya the NGO ni has the interest. The NGO indirectly involved but they have the interest in the conflict. If the case 
uh, if the if Muhammad Sajak win the case, so it become the president case. Uh, president case, case pendahulu, case yang akan dijadikan rujukan for future occurrence. Okay. Itu dia punya uh, pro and cons. Eh? Dia punya uh, apa tu? Uh, uh, itulah. <laughs> okay, so assess the nature of relationship among stakeholders including their willingness and ability to negotiate with each other. So kalau boleh dalam konflik ni kita nak cuba so pasal daya upaya supaya the conflict to be resolved between the two parties directly. Uh, kalau contohnya kalau case Lan and the type writer dan Siti Nodiana ni. So the case ni uh, dia hanya discuss dengan di, di, di antara dia orang je tak melibatkan third party lagi. Okey kalau bawa ke mahkamah kan parti. So nanti kita akan discuss lagi macam mana negotiation tu dan macam mana pula uh, konflik yang di resolve ni melalui pihak ketiga. Dan pihak ketiga ni dia ada beberapa jenis lagi. Okey yang sebenarnya kalau boleh court adalah laluan terakhir. Okey. So build rapport and understanding among stakeholders where possible. Enhance the problem solving and analytical skill of local stakeholders in addressing current and future conflict, which is the capacity building is an important part of participatory conflict analysis. So meaning, meaning that during the process, we want to invite the participation of both parties, kedua-dua parti, supaya dia bagi idea macam mana dia nak selesaikan konflik dia. Contohnya, contohnya konflik di antara dua jiran yang disebabkan oleh gangguan bunyi. Contohnya salah satu jiran tu suka buka radio ataupun suka dengar muzik yang sangat kuat, terutamanya pada weekend, pada cuti pada hujung minggu. Uh, so what they should do instead of posting the issue on your social media, then you suppose then we hope we do hope that the two party ni can discuss or negotiate with each other. Okay? So increase understanding of the links between the broader social, broader social, political and economic context and resource use conflict. Nah, ini kenapa conflict analysis ni penting. Okay, so ini adalah uh, a process dalam conflict analysis. Eh? So dia ada beberapa step. First, kita tengok dekat entry level. Okay, entry level. Step pertama, planning the entry. Okay, we review the available secondary information and develop first ideas and assumptions about the conflict setting. Okay, first bila kita nak masuk uh, nak uh, dalam planning uh, entry perancangan ni dalam dalam nak dalam sesi merancang ni kita tengok dokumen. Is there any available record ke experience ke and then we develop an early assumption. Okay, and then we decide whom to contact as a stakeholder during step two, which is the entry. So the second step ni the entry in which the initial contact with disputed. Okay, so applies any information gathering methods for example interviews, discussion, document review and survey. Okay. Okay, and then step three preliminary conflict uh, conflict assessment in which mediators ataupun the disputed carry out a strategic pre, uh, preliminary conflict assessment to decide whether or not to proceed in the conflict and what uh, what steps to undertake, undertake next. Okay, if the mediators agree not to become involved, they may recommend other causes of action to the contesting parties. Eh? Then, stakeholder engagement or participation, uh, step four. Okay, deeper engagement, facilitating stakeholders' analysis of the conflict. So in which mediators help the stakeholders or the disputant to conduct their own analysis. Mediators seek to support and advance a process of self-examination and self-discovery among the conflict stakeholders. Okay. Okay, so these are the available model. Ini contoh proses dia, tapi ini adalah model yang kita nak highlightkan. Dia ada banyak model. Saya saya tuliskan kat sini sampai 13. Okay, later on I will share with everybody in our Putra ODL the books that you can refer to. Uh, the book that you can refer to when preparing your conflict analysis ni. Eh. Other than the model that I propose, you can also look for the, from the internet or any other sources that you think the model is more suitable to your case. Okay, so the first one kita tengok conflict mapping, uh, conflict mapping ni. Okay, 
So brief in terms of the description, uh, conflict mapping ni is a visual method to show relationship between conflict parties. It provides the opportunity to identify real and potential allies and uh, opponent. Okay, and then second one, ABC triangle provides for the identification of the three basic components in conflict. They are the attitudes, behavior, and contradiction. So ABC ni, they stand for attitude, behavior, and contradiction. So in ABC triangle ni, they will try to identify these three elements then propose the next step for the conflict management process. The, step, the third one, uh, uh, onion of conflict. It is also a visual method. Use the metaphor of the onion for identifying the positions of conflict parties. Next one, tree of conflict. This is also a visual method that likens a conflict to a tree. Uh, tree of conflict ni dia macam pokok. So dia andaikan konflik tu macam pokok. Okay, so the trunk of a tree represent the main problem. Atas tu, bahagian atas tu dia represent the main problem. The root the root tu is main or deeply laid causes and the leaf its consequences. Okay, and then using a next one, pyramid of conflict. Using the image of pyramid, this method is used uh, to identify people or grounds, uh, sorry, people or groups who have an interest in the conflict and its eventual perpetuation. Okay, so ni ada lagi, banyak lagi ni eh. Circle of conflict, the triangle of satisfaction, boundary model, interest right power model, dynamic of trust, the dimension model, the social style and moving beyond conflict. Okay, ini adalah contoh uh, the key question that will be asked in conflict analysis. Okay, nanti kita akan tengok satu-satu. Okay, particularly in conflict mapping. First, kita akan tanya profiling. The profiling ni, what is the pro, uh, political, economic, social and cultural context? Kalau ada isu, contohnya between a Chinese and uh, and Malay, contohnya. Uh, contoh, uh, the person ni Chinese, Malay. So, kita akan tengok what is the uh, social status? Is there any the cultural between the, the differences between the two people, two individual? Are there any significant differences? Uh, itu yang kita nak tengok. What are the emergent political, economic, social or cultural issues? Is there a history of conflict? Ada tak sebelum ni kedua-dua individu ni pernah berkonflik? Okay. Okay, the second one, causes. What are the structural causes of the conflict? Maksudnya, contohnya, is there anybody, any party, any individual that considered to be more uh, superior? And then, there, is there any party considered to be inferior? Okay, what other issues can be considered causes of the conflict? Okay, what triggers could contribute to the outbreak or further explanation of the conflict? Okay, what new factors contribute to prolonging the conflict? Apakah faktor-faktor yang recent? The current factors that yang menjadikan konflik itu berpanjangan. Okay, what factors can contribute to the escalation of uh, resolution or resolution of the conflict? Okay, then next one, kita identify the actors. Who are the main actors? Is there, is it only the two party ataupun sebenarnya ada pihak ketiga yang menghasut salah satu uh, pihak ni? Okay, and then we identify the interest. Apa dia punya uh, niat? Macam NGO tadi, goals dia, position dia, capacities dia and relationship dia dengan the disputed. Okay, what capacities for compromise and cooperation can be identified? What actors can be identified as spoilers? Siapa sebenarnya spoiler dalam konflik tersebut? Why are they, inter uh, are they international, uh, sorry, intentional spoilers? Uh -huh. Okay, maksudnya ada batu api tak kat situ? Okay, and then the next one, dynamics. Dynamics ni how did uh, or might the conflict develop? So, macam saya kata tadi eh, dalam tuntutan harta sepencarian tadi, niat asal tu mungkin uh, nak dapatkan hak penjaga anak-anak-anak daripada awal. Dan lama tu dia start tuntut matrimonial uh, uh, tu, buat harta tuntutan hak sepencarian. Okay. Next one pula, uh, dia tukar lagi. So the dynamic ni dia akan tengok the direction tu. Daripada hak penjaga anak-anak, tuntutan hak pencarian dan apa lagi next one. Okay, so what are the windows of, uh, of, of uh, opportunity? Ada tak peluang untuk kita uh, kita selesaikan uh, konflik tersebut cara baik? 
What are the scenarios? Can you imagine for changing the conflict dynamics? Scenario ni apakah faktor-faktor yang sebenarnya menyebabkan individu tu mengubah direction tuntutan tersebut? Okay. Ha, ni. Ni contoh. Mana yang kita nampak benda ni? Biasa yang kita nampak. Museum. Betul tak? For some people, it give a religiousity or spiritual meaning. Kan? Ha, kan? Untuk yang dua orang ni, gambar ni ataupun uh, arka ni, dia, dia bagi dia punya, dia adalah sumber kehormatan dalam dia punya uh, kepercayaan. Okay, but from people perspective, dia adalah national treasure. So, dilema. Mana satu yang betul? Yang ni betul ke? Atau yang ni betul? Ha. Satu benda saja, tapi it can give different meaning based on the culture, based on individual background, based on individual individual belief and so on. Satu benda. Sebab itulah konflik ni boleh berlaku. Sebab tidak semua orang boleh tengok satu benda tu dalam semua perspektif. Dalam satu, dalam semua sudut. Okay. Tak, kita tak mampu untuk tengok ke semua sudut. That's why konflik tu boleh berlaku. Okay. Okay. Next one. Kita start dengan konflik mapping. Okay, so conflict mapping ni tadi a logical step to identify the kind of intervention which is appropriate for dealing with the conflict constructively. Okay, so it need to conduct an in-depth conflict analysis to develop a relevant mapping. So mapping dia ni ada uh, empat komponen ni. Sorry, enam. Okay, enam. First, they identify the history. History ni maksudnya ada tak... Uh, Kisah sebelum ni antara kedua-dua pihak ni. Okay. And then the context, it is asking the question related to what is the scope and character of the context of setting within which the conflict takes place. Okay. Nanti you all baca balik eh. Slide eh. Okay. And then sebab saya nak laju. Sebab takut kita tak ada masa. Okay. And then parties, they will identify. The, sec, uh, the third one, they akan identify the parties. Pihak-pihak yang terlibat. Who are the actors of the conflict? Who are the primary and secondary uh, parties? Primary ni maksudnya orang yang memang directly ataupun secara langsungnya memang terlibat dengan konflik tu. The secondary parties ni macam contoh NGO tadi. Okay, dia tak terlibat dengan konflik tu tapi dia ada kepentingan dengan konflik tu. Okay, who are the interested third parties? Are you a party to the conflict? Nah, kita pula tanya diri kita. Kalau kita a mediator orang ketiga ni Adakah kita pun sebenarnya terlibat secara langsung dengan konflik tersebut. Next one, kita identify the issues. What are the issues involved in the conflict? Then you list down all the issues of discussion related to the conflict. Which of these issues can be considered a real cause of the conflict and which of them are conflict behavior. So daripada isu ni lah, kita akan identify apakah sebenarnya isu utama dia. Adakah betul isu utama dia kalau dalam kes Muhammad Sajak tu betul ke kes kes utama dia adalah kes uh, uh, apa tu kes tukar jantina ataupun sebenarnya dia yang uh, uh, apa tu dia sendiri yang buat hal ha, eh? mana satu sebenarnya sebab kadang-kadang kita kita akan dikonfuskan dengan perkara yang sebenarnya bukan isu utama daripada konflik tu kita been explore or manipulate Okay, so after kita identify the issue, then we can list down what is the main issue of the conflict. Okay, next one, the dynamics. Uh, so the question that we, we might ask, what were the precipitating events? How did the issues emerge and transform? How have uh, issues transformed or proliferated? To what extent have the conflict parties' position on the issues become polarized? Next one, then only then we suggest the solution. So what are the suggestion of the parties and an involved observer for resolving the conflict? And then what resources and tools in the possession of the conflict parties could be used to manage or even resolve the conflict? So sebenarnya kita tengok balik dekat kita punya disputant. Apakah chance dia untuk diorang sendiri selesaikan konflik diorang? Okay, ni ada the improved version eh, in 2006. So dia lebih kurang sama cuma ada sedikit perbezaan lah. So you all boleh tengok mana-mana yang you all rasa sesuai to be used in your 
uh, assignment. Okay, and then in terms of application, uh, ni contoh saya, uh, I compile, I provide to you the example of conflict mapping application that been used in conflict mapping and analysis in Uganda, in Uganda. And then this is also the critic for the first model, eh? Okay, evaluating power uh, conflict mapping technique, not Kivu campaign 2006. Okay, dia guna model tu untuk not Kivu campaign in 2006. So you all boleh click the link and then you can see how the how uh, how you can use the conflict mapping as a guideline to analyze your conflict of interest. Okay, any questions so far? So Alan, okay. So next one we proceed with ABC triangle, uh, attitude, behavior, and contradiction. Okay, so uh, uh, this, is, this model eh, has been uh, introduced by Johan Galtung. Johan Galtung ni is one of the masterpiece in peace studies. Hmm, ni memang bapa lah, bapa ke dalam uh, pen, uh, pengajian, uh, pengajian keamanan, peace studies. Okay, so he's the one that proposed this model. So dia kata ada tiga elemen penting dalam ABC model ni. Okay, attitude. Okay, uh, behavior and contradiction. So, dia dividekan uh, benda ni kepada sesuatu yang latent. Latent ni sesuatu yang tak boleh nampak. Latent, which is theoretical, inferred and subconscious. Dengan satu lagi adalah manifest level, which is empirical, observed and conscious. Dia macam iceberg. Iceberg tu kan ada yang kat bawah kita tak nampak, yang kat atas tu kita nampak. Okay, masa iceberg eh. Okay. So yang nampak tu considered to be behavior. Behavior ni boleh jadi cara kita bercakap, komunikasi kita, tone yang kita gunakan. Macam mana kita nak identify sesuatu memang uh, memang situasi tu dikonsider sebagai situasi konflik, kita tengok tone yang digunakan, bahasa yang digunakan. Adakah tone tinggi, bahasa yang digunakan kasar ke tak, kesat ke tak. Okey. Daripada tingkah laku. Tingkah laku ni boleh jadi a uh, uh, air muka, gesture Okay, ataupun physical violence. Is there any violence involved yang kita boleh nampak? So, behavior ni sesuatu yang kita boleh nampak manifest. Eh? A and B ni, A ni adalah re re uh, reflected by something that we cannot see but it is actually that. Okay, sebab kadang-kadang konflik -kadang ni dia bukanlah sesuatu yang saja kita boleh nampak. Dia sebenarnya ada yang dia tak boleh nampak. For example, dissatisfaction. Ketidakpuasan hati. Kadang-kadang kita tak express our dissatisfaction but it is there. The conflict meaning that the conflict already, already exist. Okay, so attitude ni in terms of thoughts dalam kepala kita. Kita rasa macam eh, orang ni ada busuk hati je. Ha, contoh, it's already there. Okay, and then feelings. We feel bad about the person. Uh, about someone. So it's already there. And then will. Ha, niat eh. Kemahuan. Okay, next one, contradiction in terms of distribution. We feel there is a contradiction. For example, there is only one chair to be distributed to three employees within the organization. Ada satu kerusi je. Kerusi tu kerusi baru yang memang dynamic, memang uh, apa tu memang cantik, memang bagus, memang selesa. Tapi uh, memang nak, memang ada tiga staff dan kan ada satu kerusi je. So, limited resources. So, siapa yang akan dapat kerusi tu? So, why he or she get the chair? Contoh, benda yang simple. Okay, position. Okay, and then order or turns. Hmm, siapa nak kena ambil shift, contohnya, and so on eh. Okay. So, dia kata understand conflicts, component and element applicable to all levels for individuals, group or communities and even states. Okay, so psychology behind the development of conflict is considered to be uh, sim to be uh, similar at both the micro and macro level. Micro ni sama ada unit kecil ataupun unit besar. And it propose that conflict consists of three basic components yang saya mention tadi lah. Eh, attitudes, behavior and contradiction. Okay. Any question related to ABC model? Ada eh? Jelas eh? Okay, next one is the conflict onion. So, conflict onion ni propose the conflict model ni based on bawang. Uh, onion. Okay, dia ada tiga lapis. The needs, the needs ni our inner needs. In which kita kata yang kita mesti dapat. Inner needs. Interest, what we really want. 
The second lapisan kedua, our, our interest, what we really want. Our position, what we say we want. Okay, the conflict is said to happen according to the conflict onion models. Ni, when, when people say different things from, uh, apa tu, bila dia kata sesuatu yang against the needs or interest. Faham tak? Deep in your side, you are not happy with the situation. But when you express it, you say that I'm okay with it. Uh, so the conflict is said to happen according, uh, according to conflict onion if there is a differences between the needs, interest and position. Faham? Bila contradict sahaja between needs, interest and position tu, maka berlakulah konflik. Keperluan kita naik, need kita lain. Okay, but what we express differently, different. Ha, sebab tu konflik tu berlaku okay? ha, Dia banyak berlaku dalam group Contohnya when you consider Contohnya you are you are the youngest daughter The youngest sibling in your uh, in your family You think that your spending is lesser than your sister Then you ask for more But when thinking about uh, uh, the financial stability of your parents Then you just say that oh it's okay What you give me already enough Ha, tu contoh okay, Sama juga di tempat kerja ha, Bila mula-mula kita kata yang uh, I deserve uh, Salary increment Contoh Due to my performance, due to my achievement But when uh, During the uh, performance review What you said to your boss I'm okay with whatever you give it to me ha. But later on you will express Your dissatisfaction through your Job performance Okay, itu contoh. Saya bagi contoh yang senang supaya semua turun nampak. Eh. Itu the onion ni. Okay, ni inilah dia. Eh. Ni uh, the detailed explanation. Okay, ni uh, the application is not natural resource, man uh, resource management dia buat. Dia guna model ni. They use the model to assess the natural resource. Man uh, apa tu? Sorry. They use the model in natural resource management. Okay. Okay, next one. Three of conflict. Uh, three of conflict. Okay, so the the divide ni, the, uh, according to three of conflict ni, they divide the uh, the three ni into three things, uh, three uh, three uh, three apa tu tiga bahagian. Okay, the root represent its main its main or deeply laid causes, and the leaf it, uh, the leaf is its consequences. Ke atas ni, sorry, dia bahagikan kepada dua. Okay, bahagian daun ni ke atas ni. It's the consequences of conflict. Tapi root cases ni semua pada dia adalah latent. Latent ni tak nampak. The causes ni something that you cannot see. Okay. So dia kata causes ni invisible. Clashing material interest. A lack of uh, material benefit. Differences in identity. Ideological or spiritual outlook. Stereotypes and prejudice. Frustration with interpersonal re uh, relations. Or a lack of knowledge, skills and experience for overcoming differences. Okay, so kalau contoh kita tengok lack of intercultural dialogue. Contoh, stereotype. Benda yang something yang kita tak boleh tengok. Conflict between two employees from different race within the organization. Contoh, dia ada stereotype. Uh, mungkin kita kata uh, 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 orang ni uh, with specific group of a race ni tak pandai buat kerja. Contoh, uh, we have that stereotype. Ataupun people living with HIV contohnya. Uh, how do we accept people living with HIV at our organization? Contohnya dalam organisasi kita ni ada seorang pekerja yang memang ada HIV. If let's say we know what is our stereotype or prejudice, do we have the stereotype or prejudice towards them? Hmm, kan? Uh, so dia dah ada. Orang ni ada tendensi untuk Uh, menyebarkan HIV kita dah ada dah persepsi walaupun HIV sebenarnya tak boleh uh, tak boleh tersebar macam tu je uh, so then we try to avoid working together with these people uh, dia dah start dah okay, tapi benda the causes ni the cause of conflict ni is invisible sebab so, dah ada perbezaan dah okay, and then another example violation of minority rights inadequate decision making mechanisms Intolerance, political manipulation, stereotype, lack of intercultural dialogue. Ataupun kita sendiri yang tak faham kadang-kadang bahasa. 
Uh, contohnya, in our organization, we have Kelantanese, we have Kedahan, we have Penang, Penangis. Uh, contoh. Uh, eh? So, we have the stereotype that Kelantanese ni uh, uh, stand for their brotherhood, then we should avoid them, for example. Uh, contoh. Okay. Meanwhile, the consequences ni are the things that we can see. Dia lebih kurang sama dengan ABC model. So, ABC, just ABC model ni, dia ada three elements. Okay, attitude, behavior and contradiction. But for the three, uh, the three of conflict ni, dia ada dua sahaja, causes and conflict. Okay, so ini senang je. Ini saya tak baca lah eh. Next one, the pyramid of conflict. Okay, so pyramid of conflict ni has been Uh, proposed by saya saya lupa Lady Rach eh saya lupa siapa dia pyramid of conflict ni sebab saya suka galtung tadi tu senang okey mana dah okey so according to the pyramid of uh, conflict ni dia they try to identify the conflict according to structure struktur dalam organisasi ataupun sistem dia ada dia kata dia ada three Uh, main actor. So maksudnya kalau kat sini kita tengok, they try to identify, if you use the pyramid of conflict ni, you try to identify the conflict actors or the conflict issue ni according to the dominancy ataupun the power ataupun the position hold by the parties within the conflict because we identify with the actors ni. Ha, eh? Actors contohnya dia memang dibuatkan mengikut uh, punya sistem struktur. First, top leadership. Top leadership ni consists of military, political or religious leaders with high visibility. Okay. So, uh, second, uh, the second level, middle range leaders. For example, leaders respected in sectors. Okay. Ethnic, religious leaders, academic, academic intellectuals or humanitarian leaders or NGOs. And the last one, the grassroots leaders. Okay, for example, local leaders, leaders of indigenous in NGOs, community developers, okay, local health officials and refugee camp uh, leaders. Okay, so, they identify the pyramid of conflict. Ini, they try to, uh, to identify the issue of conflict according to the structure within our society. Okay, sebab different structure, ni, different group within different structure, ni, dia ada interest yang berbeza. Okay, contohnya, kalau kita tengok Uh, top leadership ni, the approach to conflict ni focus on high level negotiation, emphasize ceasefire led by highly visible single personal mediator. Macam contoh top leader ni, dia punya interest in conflict adalah to maintain the power. Dia nak maintain kedudukan dia, they want to maintain the position. Ha, tapi kadang-kadang untuk grassroots leader ni, they just nak help the uh, citizen to get their resources ataupun needs. Ha, sedangkan middle range leaders ni dia, ada, dia adalah mediator orang tengah. Okay, the needs from the grassroots they will uh, apa tu they will uh, portray to the top leadership. Okay, so after all top leadership ni kalau kita tengok politician kita mostly ha, dia sebenarnya nak maintainkan the power. That's why tu yang jarang-jarang turun ke grassroots. Ha, bila bila keadaan tertentu saja itu sebenarnya eh dia punya proses kalau untuk pyramid of conflict ni. Okay. Uh, this one tak apa. You, you all nanti you all boleh tengok this one eh. Next one the circle of conflict. Uh, ni ni nanti tak apa. Saya tak menekankan sangat ni. Tapi terpulang pada you all nanti eh. Hak ni ni saya I give to all of you untuk baca lah. Yang saya propose yang saya suka tadi yang uh, lima tadi tu lah. And triangle, the boundary model. Tapi nanti saya, I will share with you one book that you can refer in details regarding all this model. Okay. Two model yang you all boleh pakai dalam assignment. Other than that pun you all boleh pakai. Okay, so far is there any question? Before we proceed to the next one. Doktor nak tanya. Yes. Uh, Pro ODL tadi kan doktor kata kita apa mark your attendance sebab saya nampak kat sini Pro ODL ni please mark your attendance. Caranya macam mana ya doktor? Click on the attendance link tu. Okay. Okay, can you share? Can you share your screen? Boleh tak share? Sekejap. Sekejap. I try share your screen. Saya tahu memang uh, akan ada isu dengan tu. Hmm. 
Cuba share. Hmm. Boleh share screen. Nampak ke? Belum eh? Okay, uh, okay, go to attendance. Click attendance again. Dah nampak dah? Nampak dah? Click attendance again. Ada we yang click dekat attendance tu? Atas ni, atas ni. Atas. Saya tak nampak screen sekarang. Tak nampak. Ha, klik situ, attendance. Eh, mana tadi? Betul ke ni? Mana attendance saya tak nampak Sekarang doktor nampak apa dekat screen saya? Saya nampak, uh, nampak navigation. Navigation? Apa tu? Atas sikit, scroll, uh, scroll up. Okay, down. down. Okay, okay. Down. Oh ni, attendance. Okay, uh, clear that one. Okay, scroll down. Tak ada apa pun. Oh ni, ni. Oh, bawah. Okay. Ah, ada. Okay, go to. Ah, submit attendance. Cuba tekan. Oh ni. Huh? Ah uh, tu present late excuse absent. Ah uh, present present safe uh, changes. Safe changes. Ah. Uh -huh. oh. Saya punya saya punya Windows tak sama macam you all. Ah uh, dah. Oh. So kalau yang kelas lepas tu doktor macam ni juga tu. Supposedly macam ni tapi tak apalah. Yang terlepas tu is okay. Okay. Thank you doktor. Thank you. Mana saya nak share balik? Ah, tutup je. Tutup je. Okay. Thank you, Rota. Okay, next one ni. Mm. Okay. Okay, takpelah. Ni lah bolehlah kita masuk ni sikit. Saya ingat nak masuk mediation. Tapi takpelah ni dulu. Ni sikit lagi related to teori juga but teori on causes of conflict types of conflict sorry Okay so this is our LO at the end of the session students are able to determine types of conflict according to theories and identify process of conflict according to different types of conflict Okay so kalau kita tengok eh conflict hmm. when you watch any drama drama in the television Drama, movie and so on. Okay, ataupun any news. Hmm. So, conflict ni, it makes a great television. Because it based on conflict ni, they will attract <coughs> viewer, view. Dia akan tarik view. Okay. So, for example, mass media can either increase violence or contribute to the resolution of conflict and elevation of conflict. Through mass media ni, dia sebenarnya boleh boleh menyebabkan lebih banyak konflik ataupun sebenarnya dia boleh membantu menyelesaikan banyak konflik. Dua-dua boleh jadi. Okay. For example, eh, uh, the illustration of a perfect body shape. Uh, illustration of a perfect body shape. Kita tak nampak benda tu sebagai satu konflik. Awal-awal. But it is a conflict of identity for those women. Sebab dia kan, contohnya bila dia dalam pemilihan model contohnya. Model tak kira lah, model baju ke, model tudung ke, model bedak ke. Okay, dia akan pilih seorang model yang ada shape kulitnya putih. Hmm, eh? Mesti nak nak jadi model ni kulit ni macam ni. Mukanya mestilah lonjong. Contohnya lehernya jinjang, kulitnya putih. Dia tak boleh kulit gelap. Kalau kat Malaysia ni, saya rasa still difficult to see model yang berkulit sawo matang. Kulit gelap. Right? It is a conflict dah. Why? Because we educate our child. If you want to be in television, you should have this type of body 
Ini yang you all kena ada skin tone and so on. Okay. Uh, eh. uh, tanpa kita perasan eh. Tanpa kita perasan. Okay. So media shape what we see and hear about conflict. Okay. Because whatever been uh, portrayed in the media ni sebenarnya apa yang dirasakan betul oleh media tersebut. Okay. Dan common journalist principle if it bleeds, it leads. Hmm. Ini common. Hmm. Makin benda tu banyak konflik, then you will increase the rating. Ha, macam mana the TV3 compete with Astro last time contohnya to attract the view. Ha, that's why dia bawa. Bawa lah benda-benda dia. Okay and then media mostly covers conflict not peace building. Ha, sebenarnya, sebenarnya kebanyakan media kita ni banyak post something related to conflict. Not peace. Not the solution on how we can resolve the conflict. Tapi nowadays dia, we can see there are a few awareness. For example, by women aid organization. For example, to fight for women's and uh, child's right. Uh, women aid organization salah satu NGO lah eh. Sangat, uh, sangat menekankan hak kanak-kanak uh, dan juga uh, wanita yang tertindas. Okay. And then those who run the media tend to favor for values. Immediacy. Drama, simplicity and ethnocentrism. Ha, ini kalau kita tengok benda yang biasa lah dalam kita punya drama. Okay, ini dia punya uh, apa tu uh, explanation regarding the four principles ni. Okay, so conflict ni dalam business setting pula, it is very expensive. Uh, expensive. Kalau the case has been to the uh, to the labor court for example, Okay, managers ataupun exec has to spend a lot of time to spend to study the case, to defend the case. And then, dia akan hilang satu talent juga. Satu buang masa, waste the time kan. Satu lagi, kita akan hilang talent kita, staff kita, employee kita. Okay, it is a counterproductive, okay, time consuming and labor intensive. Okay, in which, uh, ini adalah example of Konflik, uh, sebenarnya konflik, prolong konflik. Sebabkan satu konflik, dia akan ada lagi the continuous continuous conflict. Contohnya turnover, high rate, high turnover rate. Itu pun konflik. Mesti ada sebab kenapa. Decrease productivity. Okay, dismissal. Post pandemic war for talents. Okay, maksudnya kita kekurangan talent. Kenapa talent tak nak bekerja dalam organisasi kita? Sedangkan we offer a very high salary. Tapi kenapa tak nak, tak ada talent yang nak bekerja. Employee creativity. For example, if our organization is very structured. Uh, mesti apa, whatever it is, we must follow the SOP. So then we reduce the employee creativity ni. Okay. Work family conflict. If let's say we try to apa tu make sure that our staff ni selalu balik lambat. Sebenarnya kerja tu memang takkan habis but whatever it is we need try we have to try to embed the work family balance policy within our organization tak kira lah eh macam mana but last time macam contoh in government sector we have only uh, all we have only flexi work arrangement uh, eh tapi nowadays we already have the uh, BDR bekerja dari rumah work from home policy kalau in private saya rasa kita dah ada benda tu lama dah kan you all ada uh, apa tu office kat luar Uh, boleh uh, you uh, apa tu the organization uh, rent uh, one building so that the employee boleh bekerja mana-mana yang dia suka okay and then employee engagement workplace violence uh, bullying or cyber bullying adapting to new working environment or back to traditional way of doing work okay so kalau kita tengok the current situation during pandemic eh pandemic hari tu walaupun dia banyak Banyaklah the negative effect dia but uh, it also brings a lot of positive effect. One of it is the awareness regarding work from home ataupun work away from office. Okay, so but if let's say the uh, the, the situation turn back to normal in which we already can apa uh, to fight uh, the, the COVID-19. So is it our organization will turn back to the traditional way of doing things or we decide to change? Mana satu? Because I thought during pandemic last time, the thing that looks impossible, for example, to submit uh, claim, claim document. Previously, if we want to claim anything, then we have to submit the hard copy, contohnya. 
But during pandemic, why it is possible? Right. So is it sebab, sebab siapa yang saya nampak pattern yang saya nampak lah within uh, within the government for government agency lah particularly. Bila dah habis pandemik ni, bila dah employee can can be at office, so then they, they request for hard copy again. Ha. So it turn back to zero balik. Okay. Ha, ini contoh dia, new remote policy, apa yang kita boleh adjust, new way of measuring performance. Ada tak elemen performance tu dalam dokumen kita tu need to be revised accordingly. Okay, then new employees benefit package. For example, last time kita tak embed the Uh, the COVID-19 package tu possible, uh, possible tak untuk kita embed few uh, apa tu few leave uh, special untuk COVID-19 uh, dalam kita punya employees package contoh okay and then types of conflict according to the level of conflict, uh, level of analysis so basically eh uh, conflict jenis-jenis uh, conflict ni kita boleh tengok daripada segi level dia Level dia. So analisis dari segi level dia ada tiga, empat level, sorry. Tapi saya rasa kita akan sehanya sempat tengok sampai tiga kot. Okay, intrapersonal and interpersonal. Intrapersonal within an individual, interpersonal between individual, intragroup and intergroup, intraorganisation and interorganisation. Okay, international ni kalau let's say you all nak cover then should be fine lah. Okay, so intrapersonal ni conflict that occurs within a person. For example, intrapsychic conflict. Okay, threat to a person value. So intrapersonal ni dia berlaku sebabnya berlakunya ter, uh, ancaman terhadap nilai individu. Okay, so according to uh, Shemohan ni, there are three types of intrapersonal conflict. The first one, approach-approach conflict in which it occurs when a person has to choose Uh, between two positive and equally attractive alternative. Uh, eh? Kalau approach-approach ni, you have two positive outcome, positive options, then you have to choose be one between the two. For example, choosing between promotion in the organization or a new job with another firm. Promotion within the organization or a new job with another firm. Uh, mungkin dua-dua salarinya ada uh, di another firm tu salary dia tinggi. The current organisation kita kita been promoted but the salary tu lesser than the new firm. Ha uh, eh, dua-dua menarik. So you have to choose one. Okay, the second one avoidance avoidance conflict in which it occurs when a person has to choose between two negative and equally unattractive alternative. Kalau kat atas tadi senang. So, dua-dua baik. Dua-dua dua-dua positif. So, you just choose either one. Okay. Dua-dua ada uh, uh, positive outcome. Tapi yang second ni, dua-dua ada negative outcome but you have to pick one. Okay. For example, you have to choose between accepting a job transfer to another town or have the employment terminated. Ha, ni contohnya transfer lah. Kena transfer. Okay, kena, kena pilih salah satu. Okay, the last one, approach avoidance conflict in which it occurs when a person has to choose between something that has both positive and negative result. Okay, for example, accepting or not accepting a job with a higher pay but with increased responsibilities that demand a lot of personal time. Ha, ni, contoh. Approach, uh, approach avoidance conflict. So, there are tiga benda. So, benda ni, how to choose ni, it depends on us. So, that's why the conflict happens within us, inter, intrapersonal. Okay, so we need to decide. Okay, so the intrapersonal conflict ni can be explained by, by the psychodynamic theory. Okay, psychodynamic theory. So, the psychodynamic theory ni is a psychological theory developed by Sigmund Freud and his followers in which okay in which according to the theory uh, the, the main idea of the theory dia kata people experience conflict because of their intrapersonal states and dia kata individu ni setiap individu ni dia menghadapi intrapersonal conflict ni sebab apa sebab dia punya intrapersonal states keadaan intrapersonal dia okay in which dia kata there are two possibilities 
Intrapersonal state ni dia ada two possibilities. Either the non-substantive conflict need to be released whereas in which there is a need to release tension unrelated to the other person in the situation or misplaced or displaced conflict. Okay, dia kata kita punya intrapersonal state ni ada dua. Non -sub, dia kata ada non-substantive conflict. Non-substantive ni maksudnya konflik tu tak berasas pun. Tapi dia mesti dirilisikan. Okay, ataupun misplaced or displaced conflict. In which we add up, uh, add out with the wrong person over the wrong issue. Okay, ni contoh. Okay, contoh eh. When I'm going to leave for an extended trip, I often wind up fighting with my husband before I go over some insignificant but overblown issues. This time, I was really aware of the tendency and we had avoided any major blow-ups. Okay. Okay. It took a toll, though, in my response to a neighbor's irritating comments at the shared swimming pool. Dia nak pergi out station. So, setiap kali dia pergi out station, dia memang akan gaduh dengan suami dia. Okay. So, hari tu dia avoid. Dia tahu dah, uh, dah tahu ada tendensi untuk gaduh dengan suami dia. Dia avoid suami dia. Dia turun ke bawah. Turun ke bawah pula, dia jumpa dengan neighbor dia dan neighbor dia bagi irritating comment. Okay. So, normally I simply would have left the situation. But I won't up telling him off in no uncertain term. Biasanya, hari biasa dia just avoid. Dia just biarkan je, ignore. Tapi hari kejadian tu, dia jawab. Apa the comment given by the neighbor. Okay. So, I was really embarrassed that I blew up. Not only was the issue simply not worth the anger I felt, but I didn't even know this person before and now I feel like I have to avoid him. They avoid satu conflict, but she created another conflict. Okay. So, ini ini dia eh, contoh isu konfliknya over the wrong issue, over the wrong issue towards the wrong person. Ha, sebab dia isu dia dengan suami dia which is related to outstation. But she express it towards another person which is the stranger. The safe place. Dia rasa benda tu selamat. Safe place which is the stranger. Eh? Ha, dia, dia dah lepaskan konflik dia tu dekat orang lain. Okay, so dia kata according to theory psychodynamic theory ni, dia kata mind ni is a body of psychic mind ni kita punya fikiran ni consist of uh, consist of body of psychic energy. Ada ada tenaga psychic dalam kepala kita that is channeled into various activity. Ada tenaga psychic dalam kepala kita, dalam minda kita in which tenaga ni will be channeled into various places in our body. Okay. Okay, then our body ni akan buat pelbagai activities. Okay, and then the activity ni di boleh dikategorikan sama ada appropriate or inappropriate. Ha, appropriate tu bila kita, contohnya tenaga tu disalurkan di kepala dan kita memikirkan sesuatu benda yang positif. That meaning that it is appropriate. But if our mind think about something that is uh, negative, so it is inappropriate. Sama juga bila tenaga psychic tu disalurkan ke tangan. Bila kita gunakan our hand tu uh, untuk bersalam dengan orang lain, so it is a positive thing. But if we use our hand to slap other people, other people, so mean that meaning that we channel our psychic uh, psychic energy into inappropriate place. Okay, so ada dua benda. Eh? So people tend to misplace or displace conflict when they feel that dealing with other person directly is not possible or only make things worse. So bila kita reflect balik kes perempuan tadi, she thinks that when she uh, when she if let's say she deal with her husband, it make things worse. Okay, it is impossible to convince her husband related to the outstation. Contoh, bila dia kata dah, memang tak boleh dah nak deal dengan boss. Because when I deal directly with my boss, for example, it will make things worse. So therefore, okay, this situation ni sebenarnya create the tension dalam tu. Bila kita, we, when we cannot deal directly with the person in conflict, it it create tension in our mind. Okay, tension. Okay, 
The, the tension created by trying not to fight before living on a trip gets channeled onto a safe person, which is a stranger. Okay, kita rasa bila kita dah tak lepaskan dekat suami kita tadi, kita rasa benda tu dah selamat. But sebenarnya, the tension is still there. It just wait to be expressed or channeled to another safe place. Safe person. Safe place ni tak kira boleh jadi person, boleh jadi barang. Kadang-kadang kita marah ke A tapi kita pergi hempas kerusi. Okay, because we know that way. if I deal directly with that person, then I it can it, it just make things worse. So therefore, I channel my frustration to my chair, contohnya, or to another person. Okay, so there are three aspects of human mind that affect the psychic, uh, psychic energy, which is the frustration energy. Okay, dia ada tiga benda, it, ego and super ego. Okay, it adalah unconscious aspect within a human body. Dia ada satu dalam badan kita ni, ada satu benda, satu tempat which is unconscious. Kita inherit from the present as at birth, fixed in the constitution. Okay, and then it contains libido, which is source of instinctual energy. Okay, and then it operates on the pleasure system, a principle which is tension reduction by translate bodily need into psychological wish. Di keperluan badan tapi kita transfer ataupun transform jadi keperluan psikologi. Okay, we seek pleasure to satisfy needs without regards for the cost of doing so and it is unrealistic. Itu karakteristik A. A ni unrealistic. Kalau kita nak benda tu, I want it now. Kita tak consider the, uh, the environment, the circumstances and so on. Okay. The third, as kita tengok the super ego pula. The super ego ni di oppose the eight. Totally something yang against the eight. Okay, it contains ego ideal and conscious. So kalau eight tadi dia unconscious, unconscious. Kita nak, kita nak. Tapi super ego ni dia betul-betul against the eight. Ha, kalau kita nak, supposedly kalau ni kita tak boleh buat. Ha, eh? Ego ideal equals to an idea of what a person would like to be. Okay, conscience contains moral and other judgment concerning correct or incorrect behavior learn from parents and society. So, super ego ni, dia adalah sesuatu elemen yang uh, kita rasa kita nak jadi. So, contoh kita nak jadi seorang manusia yang baik. So, nak jadi super seorang yang baik ni, kita ada satu pemberat. Kalau nak jadi orang baik, tak boleh buat macam ni. Tak boleh pentingkan diri. Okay. Ha, ini super ego ni adalah untuk menjadi seorang yang sempurna ikut ukuran kita. Okay. And then for example, parents try to punish a child for immoral behavior and give reward for moral behavior through feelings like guilt or proud. Ha, ini untuk super ego. Ego pula, it mediates the uh, mediates between it and super ego. Dia kat tengah-tengah. Dia akan balancekan balik between the extreme need of ego and extreme need of super ego. Eh, sorry, dia akan balancekan between the uh, the extreme need of it and extreme balance of super ego. Okay, so decision making components of personality, okay, it governed by reality principle. Okay, so it postpone the discharge of energy until the actual object that will satisfy the needs has been discovered or produce. Okay, for example, eh, they kata, in ego, in conflict, ego tries to reconcile the desires of it. For example, I want it all and I want it now. Okay, with the constraint of super ego, which nice, pe nice people do through temper tantrum. Hmm. Maksudnya super ego ni betul-betul orang yang sempurna. Ha, tapi tak tak boleh semua kita tak buat kita tak boleh tapi doesn't mean yang untuk semua situasi kita tak boleh express kita punya kemarahan kan ha, so that's why kita perlukan ego ni okay so must contain aggressive impulse and control the level of anxiety uh, conflict uh, creates okay ha, ini persamaan lah apa tu keadaan antara ketiga-tiga ni a super ego and ego okay Okay, need defense mechanism in the process. Ha, ni tak apa, ni saya skip lah. Okay, ni example eh. Nanti kalau you all ada masa, kalaulah you all ada masa, I hope that you all ada masa, 
Antara contoh intrapersonal konflik yang recently happening adalah yang seperti yang dinyatakan dalam artikel ni. Intrapersonal conflict of bloggers, psychological perspective. Okay. From the article ni, they discuss, the authors discuss about the development of virtual personality. Okay. Because kalau kita tengok daripada segi personality, eh, dia ada personality introvert, extrovert. Okay. Sebelum ni, without, uh, uh, before the, uh, apa tu, the use, the widely use of uh, virtual or social media ni, Okay, kita hanya identify individual ni based on the actual personality. Either they are introvert or extrovert. Okay, for extrovert ni, kita uh, we don't really mind lah eh, because tak banyak isu sangat related to extrovert ni. Dia ada isu lain. Tapi yang isu dia lah introvert. The introvert person nowadays that we see in our actual life, not necessarily an introvert in the virtual world. Eh? Sebab keyboard warrior tu Dia sebenarnya boleh jadi dia adalah introvert Sebenarnya But in virtual In virtual world They are very active In uh, expressing their opinion Shockingly uh, So the development of virtual psychology ni Virtual personality ni Ni adalah antara penyebab berlakunya Split personality Bipolar personality Uh, inilah dia okay. uh, Ini isu dia eh. And then kat situ dia tengok juga The function of the uh, blog ni As a communication uh, medium Self-presentational Dia ada tengok kelebihan juga uh, Blog ni last, Tapi blog ni dia uh, dia popular I talk uh, in 1990s kot 1990s or 2000 Sekarang dah tak popular dah Blog ni 1990s kot During my time last time 2000 something kot, 2010. 2010 and below sebelum tu. Okay. Sebab dia diguna, boleh digunakan as a communications uh, medium. Self-presentational ni maksudnya you are able to express your own opinion regarding a certain issue. Cognitive, entertaining. Okay, entertaining ni because sometimes you can, uh, apa tu, you, you all boleh Uh, adjust the, uh, the the windows to according to your preference okay and then memorial and psychotherapeutic maksudnya for those introvert ni they can use blog ni as a place to express uh, themselves as a therapeutic lah therapeutic okay and then frequent use of the internet leads to narrowing of social ties right ini issue yang last time but nowadays i thought most of us already can can uh, apa tu uh, deal with the with this issue lah kot okay frequent use of the internet leads to narrowing of social ties because we spend a lot of time uh, in social media for example shrinking of communication within a family maksudnya even kita nak guna perkataan yang yang tepat bila kita nak panggil mak cik dengan pak cik kita pun dah susah ni Uh, the, the language that been used ni Sebab kita apa? Sebab kita kurang komunikasi Direct dengan keluarga And development of depressive disorders Okay Establish reduce ways of shaping the image of a communicative partner Sebab apa? Sebab kita, bila kita terlalu banyak spend masa depan uh, Depan um, social media ataupun blog ni Kita punya uh, identity as a communicator ni Uh, uh, susah, sukar untuk kita develop okay? Depersonification of communication In which difficulties in expressing the abstract uh, dia, Kita akan ada kesukaran tu okay? And then virtual personality has the following characteristic Immaterialness Or reduction of personality to textual messages Anonymity uh, You over tengok eh? Anonymity Anonymity ni kalau kita saya tak tahu uh, for those ada tak kat sini yang involved dengan hiring hiring process hiring process within your organization ada tak when uh, when the candidate submit the CV uh, you can see that they, they didn't use their real name for the email panda ke uh, dia guna macam-macam lah panda at gmail.com uh, hantu raya at gmail.com Contoh, 
Uh, so this is probably as the result of virtual personality because they want to hide their, per, their, per, their individual detail. detail. Uh, anonymity ni maksudnya in, dan, dan kewujudan uh, fake account uh, contoh because they don't want themselves to be identified by others. Okay? And then a possibility to hide the real name and take a pseudonym or nickname, free set of personal traits, plurality or opportunity to create several virtual personalities or fake account. Okay, dia nak express themselves, nak kata yang dia sebenarnya yang menyuarakan benda tu dia tak berani. But they use instead, they use fake account. Ni sebenarnya penyakit sebenarnya. Okay, and then automation or possibility to stimulate activity of a virtual personality with the help of computer program. So inilah isu yang dibincangkan in which I thought it is very interesting. Okay, dalam artikel ni. Kalau you all ada masa lah eh. Sebab it can be addressed in our organization setting as well. Bila kita ambil pekerja dalam generasi ni, so these are the issues that probably happening within our organization. Isu ni. Okay. Okay. So next one is interpersonal conflict. So interpersonal conflict ni uh, sangat biasa lah eh. Konflik yang berlaku antara dua ataupun lebih individu. In which it is referring as a dyadic conflict. Okay. It refers to uh, conflict within two or more organizational members of the same or different hierarchical level or unit within superior or subordinate for example and it depends on interpersonal communication. So kalau yang intrapersonal tadi, it depends on our belief, belief system. Kalau intrapersonal, tapi interpersonal ni, it depends on communication. So bila kita kata interpersonal communication ni, semua jenis bentuk komunikasi. Gesture, okay, facial expression, tone, voice, language, Okay, so itulah elemen yang akan dibincangkan dalam interpersonal communication. So, maybe influenced by intrapersonal conflict. So, interpersonal conflict ni dia boleh di, boleh berlaku disebabkan juga disebabkan oleh intrapersonal. Intrapersonal meaning that the, the, the dissatisfaction that develop in ourselves. Okay, disebabkan keadaan tadi. Bila kita tak dapat deal directly dengan orang tu, so kita develop dissatisfaction dalam kita develop tension ataupun frustration in ourselves instead of deal directly with the person, so we express our uh, anger to another party. Okay? So, uh, conflict related to interpersonal conflict banyak. Example adalah work family conflict or family to work conflict. Banyak. Work family ni banyak juga. Okay, in which if let's say you are unable, unable to balance between the work and family demand, then probably, okay, you have you will express the conflict at your workplace or to your family members. Tapi kebanyakan yang berlaku adalah work to family conflict. Okay, family to work ni jarang-jarang. Ada tapi jarang-jarang. Okay, next one adalah work-life balance. Okay, horizontal conflict, vertical conflict, outward conflict and employee click. Ni biasalah jenis-jenis dia eh. Kejap eh. Okay. Any question related to psychodynamic theory? Ada soalan tak? Faham eh? Psychodynamic ni dia berkenaan dengan dalaman tu. Okay, next one, attribution theory. Okay, so according to the attribution theory ni, dia kata, in a conflict situation, one makes conclusion about the other person's behavior and that those conclusions lead to theories to explain the conflict. Okay, so attribution theory ni, dia start link the interpersonal, uh, interpersonal individu. Okay, in a uh, dyadic, uh, apa tu, antara, interaksi antara dua individu dan lebih. So, in which dia kata, before meeting the other person, before meeting the other people, one individu ni already make a conclusion about the person. Dia dah ada dah, dia punya interpretation regarding that person. Okay, and then 
this conclusion ni Okay, the gist dia, people act as they do in conflict situation because of the conclusion they draw about the other. Sebab bila kita, contohnya, uh, contohnya, kita tengok seseorang tu, kita belum deal directly, we never deal directly with the person but we already develop a certain assumption regarding that person in our mind. So that, uh, this assumption that we develop will assist or we facilitate our next behavior when we deal with the, with the person. If the assumption that we develop towards the person is positive, so we, we will treat that person positively. If the assumption developed in our mind is negative, so we <coughs> treat that person negatively. Okay, uh, itu maksud attribution theory ni. So, kita dah ada set of assumption. So, I'm sure this is common among us. Common. Okay, because if let's say I share this experience, eh, okay, I never, I never, uh, apa tu, deal directly with this person. I just see him or her for the first time. But in my mind, this statement across my mind, come to my mind. Oh damn, I can't work with this person. Pernah tak? Ah, so kita dah develop dah this assumption. Pernah tak tanya kenapa diri kita? Have you ever asked yourself why that assumption comes into your mind? Pernah tak tanya kenapa? Sedangkan kita belum belum bekerja bersama lagi. We just see him at the first time. For the first time. Okay? So conclusion about the other are based on attributions about that person or on inference about the meanings, causes or outcomes of conflict event. Okay? So dia boleh dipengaruhi oleh dua benda. Okay? Interpreter attributes. Interpreter ni meaning that kita punya. Interpreter. Interpreter personality. The way we, the assumption that we develop ni depends on interpreter interpreter personality. Personality kita ni macam mana. Okay. And then the second one is external attributes. The person, the other person circumstances. Apa circumstances dia yang menyebabkan kita perceive him or her negatively. Okay. Okay, so conflict arises because an assumption that someone has insufficient information or because of faulty conclusions drawn about the other person's behavior. So conflict according to attribution ni, dia kata wujud apabila kita tak ada maklumat yang cukup untuk interpret the person, intention, or goal and so on or because of the faulty conclusion, wrong conclusion that we did in our mind. We think that, for example, when we see this person, we think that this person uh, will destroy or will uh, uh, will uh, apa tu refrain, uh, apa tu restrain our goal attainment. For example, kita dah ada tu, kita ada that mindset. Okay, tapi sebenarnya when we deal directly with the person, the person is totally against what we assume at the first place. Tapi kalau itu kita bila kita ada peluang bekerja bersama, but if let's say we never have the experience to work together with that person. Until then, we will keep our original assumption regarding the person. Okay? Sampai bila-bila kita akan avoid that, that person. Okay? Okay. Uh, ini contoh. Eh, tak apa. Eh. Ini boleh laju lah. Eh. Hmm. Ini contoh saya bagi kat sini. Okay? Ha, ini yang kita boleh contoh kalau kita tengok dalam kes Islam and inheritance in Malaya the culture of conflict or Islamic revolution. Kalau boleh you all baca eh strongly recommended. Okey dalam matrimonial proceeding is the solemnization valid. Ha ni contoh antaranya contoh adalah Muhammad Azam Sharif okey versus Cik Norina Long. Okey so uh, the issue is related to solemn, uh, solemnization of marriage. Okey the web party solemnized their marriage in songkla okay thailand and applied for registration in sharia court penang okay so the issue before the sharia court was whether the solemnization was valid ha, dia punya nikah tu okay the sharia high court then held that by referring to the evidence produced by the respondents and the two witnesses together with a marriage certificate Certified by the Islamic Office in Songkla, Thailand, the learned judge had declared that the marriage was solemnized in accordance with Hukum Syara. 
Therefore, it was valid and deemed to be registered. Okay. However, sebab kalau ikutkan, ikutkan eh, uh, the process to solemnize the marriage according to Islamic rule ni dah valid. Settle dah sebenarnya. But according to uh, ni, ni sebenarnya uh, ni sebenarnya Islam rule. Syariah syariah law lah eh. In terms of syariah law, okay. However, if parties fail to appear before the registrar of marriage within a specific period, there will be a penalty upon registration. Section 125 of the Islamic Family Law Act 1984 provides that whoever willfully neglects or fails to report and submit application for registration of marriage commits an offence and shall be punished with a fine not exceeding 1,000 or imprisonment not exceeding six months uh, or both. Nevertheless, nothing this act or rules made under this IFLA shall be construed to render valid or invalid any marriage. Nah. Dalam IFLA ni, dia tak kata pun valid ke tak. Sesuatu perkahwinan tu bila diadakan di Thailand. Dia cuma kata, kalau perkahwinan tu tak didaftarkan dalam tempoh tertentu ni, akan kena penalti. So ni sebenarnya budaya ke? Islamic Revolution. Ha, contoh eh. Ini contoh. Budaya ataupun revolution. Ni contoh saja eh. Okay. Next one. Ada lagi tak? Saya jantikan contoh. Tak gerak pula. Okay, next one in the marriage of Y and uh, Y and K Raja Bahrain involving uh, ni case ni famous. You all boleh search ni. Y and K Raja Bahrain involving Australian and Malaysian citizenship. In this case, the important principle deduced by the court is custody issue is welfare of the child has been par uh, paramount, which might be varying from one authority than others. Okay, so. Sebab dalam kes penceraian ni sebenarnya bila dalam hak tuntutan penjagaan anak-anak isu yang ditekankan adalah kebajikan kanak-kanak. Okey, isu itu yang ditekankan. Okey, so such contradictory is largely due to outcome of each authority's judgment of what is important to constitute welfare of the child. So isu dia kat sini adalah apa yang dikira sebagai welfare, kebajikan untuk kanak-kanak ni. Apa apa sebenarnya yang elemen apa pendidikan okay, finance hak penjagaan apa lagi okey so as regard to custody order to a cross boundary marriage marriage the applicant must prove to the court that the child is a legitimate child of him or her to a valid marriage ha, sebelum tu dia kena buktikan dulu yang perkahwinan tu adalah legal uh, legitimate sah dan daripada perkahwinan yang sah. Okay. This can be done by proving the registration of the marriage as stipulated in the act. Okay. So dia kena tengok pendaftaran ni. Ha, so ni sebenarnya macam dah pelik lah kalau dalam Islam. Okay. Dia tengok pendaftaran. Sedang, sedangkan tadi saya kata pendaftaran tu tak pun membuktikan sama ada perkahwinan tu sah ataupun tidak sah menurut Islam. Eh? Okay. And then Uh, okay, if the applicant has produced the foreign marriage document other than those issued by stipulated person under the Act, another proceeding to verify such documents shall be undergone before the court can proceed to hear the custody application. Maksudnya, kalau lah let's say, walaupun, walaupun let's say, eh, perkahwinan tu sah. Okay, perkahwinan tu sah. Tapi, it is a foreign document. Foreign marriage. Maksudnya, dokumen tu di di uh, apa tu dibuat di negara lain. Ha, maksudnya dia tak diregister di Malaysia. So maksudnya kena ada lagi satu proceeding lain. So ini budaya ke Islamic law. Hmm. Okay, so another case is Ahmad Fikri bin Ali Hanafiah versus Fauziah bin binti Kamis. So ini lebih kuranglah eh. 
Okay, ni lebih kurang ni. And other case that you can refer to related to uh, matrimonial uh, case juga, proceeding juga. Eh? Okay. Next one, discrimination at workplace. Equality of women. Ah, Ini pun menarik. Okay, the case between Beatrice Fernandez versus sistem penerbangan Malaysia and Anok. Okay, mas lah ni. The case ni uh, in 2005, the first case. The first discrimination case in Malaysia. Okay, dia kata dalam case ni Beatrice, Beatrice case, the plaintiff was employed as an air stewardess and was dismissed when she became pregnant. Ha, sebab nak jadi stewardess ni, you kena maintain a specific weight and then a specific body shape. Okay, nak duduk dalam flight kan? Ha, kecuali you all, uh, you become the administrative employee lain. Kalau duduk dalam flight, memang kena ada maintain body tertentu. Okay, so the collective agreement which govern the relations between the employer and the plaintiff contain a clause which provided for two scenarios in the event that an air stewardess becomes pregnant. So, dia memang dalam dia punya employment contract tu, dia dah nyatakan. Kalau setahun wanita pregnant, dia ada dua, dua uh, consequence. Resignation or termination. Ha, maksudnya dah discriminate lah dalam employment contract tu dah discriminate women. Perempuan tak boleh mengandung kalau nak jadi stewardess. Okay, so the court did not find that the plaintiff was discriminated and reason as follow. Ha, ini dia punya finding daripada court. Court kata tak discriminate. So, dia kata ambit of the article 8 of the Malaysian Federal Constitution, equality before law, equal protection of the law only covers contravention of individual's right by a public authority, for example, the state or any of its agencies. Itu sahaja. Dia kata Malaysian Federal Constitution ni only cover the public authority. Sedangkan dia ni adalah KLC. Tak cover. The words all persons are equal before the law and entitled to equal protection of the law meant that the equality provision did not apply because the collective agreement which which uh, which was impung to the discriminatory was not law. Dia kata sebab yang dibuat ni bukan law. Ni. Resignation or termination ni bukan law. Jadi tak salah. Okay. Nah, dalam kes lain adalah Jaganathan anak lelaki uh, Mahadevan versus Lacton Contractors Malaysia Sendirian Berhad in which plaintiff work as a truck supervisor has been dismissed by employer due aided and or abet in the attempted robbery of eight rails valued at about one million belonging to kereta api tanah Melayu Berhad and syarikat MMC, MMC Gamuda Joint Venture which property was entrusted to Embrail, Lighten contra, uh, Contractors in Malaysia Sendirian Berhad for the purpose of laying new rail track. Ha, ini kes dia, Jaga Nada ni dituduh mencuri lah eh, mencuri rail ni. Ini kes lain yang you all boleh tengok. Okay. Mana dah. Okay. So next one ni intragroup conflict ni ha, ni uh, antara dua kumpulan lah eh. So refers to conflict between two or more members of the same group of conflict. Okay it has a, a significant influence on group dynamic across different level in organization. For example it will influence the decision making, decision -making process, project group and production team. Okay there are two two main types. Ha, so you all nanti you all boleh tengok kat sini eh. Task conflict dengan relationship conflict. Okay, so dalam kita punya sistem, okay, yang paling banyak berlaku dan yang paling banyak berlaku dan yang paling susah untuk diselesaikan adalah relationship or emotional conflict. Okay, in which yang ni lah paling suka untuk kita handle. Tapi most of managers nowadays spend a lot of time to handle or to settle relationship conflict. Sebenarnya ini buang masa sebenarnya. Tapi nak tak nak, in within the organization, we have to work, to work, work on it. Okay. Next one. Ni tak apa, ni laju. Okay. Next theory related to conflict is relationship theory. Okay. So relationship theory ni highlight on how the relationship between the people involved in a conflict affects the way uh, the conflict is enacted and resolved. Okay. 
There are two types of relationship theory. There are the social exchange theory and system theory. Okay, social relationship, social exchange and social uh, uh, system theory. Okay, social exchange theory ni, dia developed by Kelly and Tibault in which dia kata, people evaluate their interpersonal relationship in terms of their value. Okay, in tadi kita tengok, kalau ikut uh, teori psychodynamic tu dalaman. Attributes ni dia kata konflik tu berlaku bila kita ada wrong judgement or wrong assumption towards another people. Tapi social exchange teori ni dia kata konflik tu berlaku disebabkan individu ni, seseorang individu ni value the relationship into two things. Cost and reward. Cost ni maksudnya how many effort, how many investment he or she put into the relationship. Reward ni how many return, how many result or output that he or she receive as a result of the relationship. So contohnya dalam hubungan intimate relationship between couples contohnya. Kalau uh, the the guy said that he spent a lot of time, a lot of money to the girlfriend contohnya. But if he or she, if he thinks that the result or the output that he received from the girlfriend is not enough or is not compatible with what the cost that has been invested, he may decide to broke the relationship. Stop the relationship. Itu maksudnya. Eh? Maksudnya kita tengok hubungan tu, hubungan individu tu, hubungan interpersonal kita ni dalam bentuk bisnes. Cost and rewards. Sebab tu bila kita kata effort yang kita bagi tu tak sepadan dengan apa yang kita dapat. So then that's why akan berlakunya penceraian atau akan berlakunya konflik. Ha, contohnya dalam kes Tang Monida. Ha, saya highlight Tang Monida ni sebab saya pun follow juga kes dia tu. Because to me it's not the case that is related to religion. Ha, eh? The case dah beyond that. In which I thought it is about Uh, 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 about the rights, uh, the humanity rights, uh, dan saya rasa itu itulah sistem di sana, uh, eh, sistem kasta, sistem monarki di sana yang sangat mempengaruhi keputusan kes tersebut. Itu yang menyebabkan saya tertarik dengan kes tu. Okay, uh, contohnya kes dia uh, Tang Monina ni dengan manager dia. Probably uh, the manager decided to step Tang Mo ni because of she thinks that the outcome that she received from being the manager of Tangmo for so long is not compatible with the cost that she invest probably okay uh, so nanti you all tengok kat sini eh dia punya penerangan tapi basic penerangan itu dia okay lain ni senang je ni okay next one system theory so system theory ni introduced by Ruben So in way dia kata assume that conflict represent a breakdown in communication from the normal harmonic state of affairs. Okay, so yang ni sistem teori ni dia lebih kurang sama dengan attribution teori tadi. So dia kata uh, uh, konflik dalam mengikut sistem teori ni berlaku disebabkan faulty in communication. Okay, so if human relationship are top of a system, communication and then and therefore conflict are not only inevitable but also continual. So dia kata sebabkan um, uh, kalau kita tengok konflik ni sebagai satu sistem, so konflik ni adalah sesuatu yang kita tak boleh elak dan dia akan berterusan berlaku. Therefore we have to accept the existence of conflict in our daily life as a normal thing. Benda yang normal, kita tak boleh avoid. It is inevitable. Okay, so conflict according to this theory is the normal state of affairs within any system. Normal state ni maksudnya memang dia akan ada. Uh, even now, with our roommate, with our husband, with our wife, even, even though it is micro or macro, small or large scale. Okay, so conflict is a necessary for the growth and adaptation of a system. Sama ada dalam hubungan perkahwinan ataupun dalam hubungan organisasi, okay, conflict is a, is a necessity for growth, for change. Okay, kalau you are belajar dalam OD, organizational change, organizational development. So we need that conflict because from the conflict ni lah we can adapt to the new changes. Okay, the new changes ni bring conflict. The conflict ni maksudnya 
uh, sesuatu yang kita rasa mengganggu comf our comfort. Okay, comfort zone. And then conflict becomes a system primary defense against technician and decay. Okay. The last one. The system. This one, the last one, which is a structural theory. Okay, dia kata conflict ni is a structured situation. Okay. Result from the condition that characterize relationship and that make interaction possible between the two, between people in the relationship. So, dia kata structural theory ni ada dua model which is process and structure. Okay, so process ni focus on the sequence of events within a conflict episode. Okay, and then structure ni focus on the condition which shape conflict behavior in a relationship. So, dalam structure ni, okay, dia akan ada isu trust, uncertainty and power. Okay, how how much we trust our boss, how much we trust our uh, our husband, how much we trust our kids. Okay, uncertainty ni meaning that if let's say we cannot 100% trust that person, so therefore there will be uncertainty, feeling of the tendency that we will be harmed. Okay, to trust ni the belief that another is benevolent, the more we trust other, the less uncertain we will feel about the other's motive in the conflict. So trust dengan uncertain kini, it is negatively linked or associated with one another. Semakin tinggi trust, semakin kurang rasa uncertainty. Okay, semakin tinggi uncertainty, semakin kurang rasa trust. Okay, so then power is something uh, a person has over another. Something. Dia boleh jadi kita ada kuasa ni sebab kita ada banyak resources. Nowadays, if you aware, the most powerful power is the ability to control knowledge or resources. Betul tak? Ability to control information or knowledge. The most powerful power recently. Ha, contohnya, kalau you all pandai guna sistem, knowledge. You all pandai guna teknologi, you all pandai buat video, knowledge. Okay? Ha, it, be, it is the most powerful power recently. Okay. And then antecedents of uh, conflict, uh, intra-group conflict ni, these are among the antecedents eh. Dalam organisasi kita, low task or goal uncertainty, increase group size, increase diversity, lack of information sharing, high task in, uh, interdependence. So sebenarnya inilah antara variables that you can consider to be included in your uh, in your dissertation project later on. Kalau let's say you are interested to study the conflict lah eh. So ini adalah antara variable yang you all boleh kaji. Okay, next one ni uh, intergroup conflict. So intergroup ni by nature... Uh, uh, konflik yang berlaku antara kumpulan tadi within group ni intergroup okay so it happen in many societies or even in many or in organization for example the conflict between two departments okay so intergroup conflict situation in which a group fight with another group okay and then it can takes many form for example eh ada case between kerajaan Malaysia versus kerajaan negeri Kelantan isu ni adalah isu hak Orang asli. Okay, hak orang asli. Masa tu kerajaan negeri Kelantan ni ambil tanah yang telah didiami bersaman oleh orang asli. In which orang asli tak ada geran tanah. Okay, then next one kerajaan negeri Selangor versus Tagung, Sagun Tasi. Sagun Tasi ni pun orang asli juga. Salah satu puak orang asli eh. Ini contoh kes. Okay, so what causes intergroup conflict? Uh, so, antara yang dicadangkan oleh social psychologists include, uh, include authoritarian authoritarian personality uh, within the group, kin selection. Kin selection ni maksudnya uh, kita pilih bulu. Uh, realistic group conflict, group threat, symbolic tree, uh, threat, intergroup anxiety and social identity. Ini contoh. Okay, ini pula contoh uh, international conflict at macro level. Macro level ni macro besar eh. For example, types of uh, war, hegemonic war, war over control of the entire world. Last hegemonic war was World War II. Okay, and then currently as what we can see, we have the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Itu contoh. Okay, ni the process of conflict. Uh, dah. 
Berapa dah? Lambat lagi 10 suku. Kita ada masa lagi. Okay. Uh, shall we proceed to the next one? Okay. Boleh eh? Ke dah tepu dah? Hmm? Tepu dah? Factors related to conflict ni okay. Saya rasa tak ada masalah kot. Nanti awak baca eh factors related to conflict. I will share the, the lecture notes later. Saya nak tekankan. Alah ni lihat ni bukan. Negotiation. Okay, shall we proceed? Boleh lagi tak? Three hours straight ni. Boleh proceed lagi tak? Boleh terima lagi? Senyum dah. Boleh terima lagi? Or we, you want to stop here and then we continue in another session? Hmm? Apa dia? Apa dia continue? Boleh. Boleh continue. Okay, good. Okay, so now... Okay, kita proceed dengan conflict management. Okay, hak ni, ni, uh, ni pun penting for your assignments lah eh. Okay, uh, so this is the LO. At the end of the session, students are able to identify the differences between cooperation and competition. And then the conflict management styles, roles of third party and negotiation. Sepatutnya negotiation dulu baru uh, third party. Okay, so in conflict eh. In conflict. So when we want to resolve the conflict, so there are five main styles that we uh, that uh, you should know. Okay, so we have avoiding style, compromising style, competing, collaborating and uh, accommodating. In which this five style ni has been divided according to... Uh, Okay, uh, it has been divided according to cooperativeness and assertiveness. Cooperativeness ni tendency for us cooperate to cooperate with others. Assertiveness ni tendency of us to think of others instead of ourselves. Itu maksudnya assertiveness ni kita banyak fikir orang lain instead of ourselves. Okay, so avoiding ni mengelak, compromising, competing and collaborating and accommodating. So these are the five styles that we commonly use either we realize it or not. Okay, we commonly use in our daily uh, conflict management sama ada kita sedar ataupun tak. Okay, so kita reflect nanti diri kita sendiri. Okay, so ini dia punya continuum win-lose dynamic of conflict. Okay, kalau kita tengok, uh, kalau kita works towards the objective of uh, other party, kita akan uh, kita akan banyak lose which is kalau kita pakai accommodate. Okay, kalau menang, uh, macam contoh first ni, if we less consider other party objective and then in which we uh, we less consider ourselves, okay, it is considered to be avoidance conflict. Dua-dua uh, tak dapat. Uh, our our opponent tak dapat matlamat dia dan kita pun tak dapat matlamat kita. So means that kita apply avoidance. Avoidance conflict. Okay, and then next one. Uh, compromise ni tengah-tengah. Okay. It's located at the middle between considering the other party, uh, the other objective as well as our objective, which is small win-win, which is compromise. Okay. Kalau collaborate ni, dia akan uh, apa tu win-win. Memang kita akan win-win. Dua-dua akan dapat masing-masing apa yang kita nak. Okay. Meanwhile, kalau compete ni, win-lose. One Akan ada satu pihak yang menang dan satu pihak yang kalah. Kalau accommodate pun, accommodate ni kita yang akan kalah. The other party will win. Will win. Okay, so kita tengok one by one, avoiding response. Okay, so avoiding response ni considered to be uncooperative and unassertive. Kalau kita tengok dekat graf ni, avoidance ni letak kat sini. 
Ah eh dia uncooperative. Uncooperative ni kita tak bekerjasama untuk menyelesaikan konflik dan kita tidak memikirkan uh, the needs of another people to resolve the conflict. Okay, so in, we neglect the interest of both parties by sidestepping the conflict or postponing a solution. Ha, kita tengok sidestepping, side maksudnya kita letak tepi konflik tu and then we postpone the solution. Okay, and then this is often the response of manager who are emotionally ill-prepared or poorly trained to cope with the stress associated with confrontation. Okay. And then shows that relationship is not strong enough to absorb the fallout of an intense conflict. So kalau dalam organisasi, kalau kita tengok ada bos yang macam ni, bos yang memang ada tendensi untuk mengelak bila setiap kali berlakunya uh, pertengkaran ataupun dispute among the staff. So inilah dia. eh. So dia sebenarnya mengamalkan avoidance conflict. Avoidance response. Okay, so repeated use of this approach causes considerable frustration for others. Okay, because issues never seem to be re, uh, to get resolved. Really tough problems are avoided because of their high potential for conflict. Employees engaging in conflict are uh, reprimanded for undermining the harmony of the work group. Uh, so sebab tu kalau avoidance ni, kalau kita regularly apply this conflict ni, the conflict tu cannot be resolved but still it can be prolonged conflict. Prolonged conflict. Okay. Okay, the second one is accommodating, accommodating response. Okay, it's it is obliging, cooperative but unassertive. Ha, eh, kalau kita tengok dia duduk kat sini, compromising. Compromising ke accommodate? Sorry, accommodate. Kat sini eh. We are, we are, uh, apa tu, we, we are considering others objective but not our own objective. Okay. Okay, so try to satisfy the other party's concern while neglecting one's own. We want to fulfill other people's wish, but we neglect our own needs. In which we become unfair, we act as unfair. We are unfair to ourselves. Okay, unfortunately, managers neglect of their firm's interest and responsibilities to accommodate the wish of others generally result in both parties losing. Okay, so the difficulties with the habitual use of the accommodating, uh, accommodating approach uh, is that it emphasizes preserving a friendly relationship. Uh, biasanya manager yang pakai uh, this response, they nak preserve the relationship with the, uh, with the client, for example. At the expense of critically appraising issues, protecting personal rights and focusing on productivity. So this may result in others taking advantage of the accommodators which lowers their self-esteem as they observe themselves being used by others to accomplish their objective while they fail to make any progress towards their own. So kalau accommodate ni, kita tend to fulfill other wish, others' wish. We neglect our own. Okay? Next one. Competing. Competing ni dia assertive but uncooperative. Uh, this competing ni meaning that we fight for our own objective but we neglect. Okay, we ignore the objective of the other party. Okay, so we attempt to satisfy our own needs at the expense of the needs of the other individual. Okay, this can be done by using formal authority. Kita guna kuasa, physical threats. Uh, as in uh, sexual harassment, for example, manipulation ploys, or by ignoring the claims of the other party. Okay, blatant use of the authority of office, for example, I'm the boss, so we'll do it my way. Contoh, or a related form of intimidation is generally evidence of a lack of tolerance or self-confidence. Okay, maksudnya kalau competing ni, they tend to use the position, the power that they have through position, in which sebenarnya indirect, indirectly it indicate that this person is a type of intolerance or a lack, lack, lack of confidence person. Okay, so that's why dia terpaksa gunakan kuasa dia. Okay, the use of manipulation of feign ignorant uh, is a much more subtle reflection of a self-centered uh, self leadership style. Okay, manipulative leaders often appear to be democratic 
by suggesting that conflicting uh, proposal will uh, be referred to a committee for further investigation. However, they ensure that the composition of the committee reflects their interests and preferences so that what appears to be selection based on merit is actually an authoritarian act. Okay, so a related ploy that some managers use is to ignore a proposal that threatens their personal interest. In this case, ni, macam contoh dalam kes nak sexual harassment lah eh. Biasanya sexual harassment yang berlaku antara boss dengan secretary, for example. So the boss has to use the power, has to use the position to threat the employee. Kalau let's say the employee let people know about the, uh, the sexual harassment issue, then dia akan use the power to dismiss the employee, for example. Okay. Next one. Okay. This is the com uh, competitive conflict escalation. Tak apa. Next one is compromising response. Okay. So compromising response ni is a middle of the road approach. Kalau perasan tadi dalam graph tadi duduk kat tengah-tengah. Okay. Accommodate kat bawah, belah kanan. Avoidance kat bawah, belah kiri. Okay. Uh, uh, competing belah atas, tapi uh, atas belah kiri. Tapi uh, untuk compromising ni dia tengah-tengah eh. So it is a middle of the road approach uh, which is means making sure that no one totally wins or loss. Okay, dua-dua tak menang, dua-dua tak kalah. Okay, by compromising, conflicting parties are settling for a workable solution rather than finding a totally mutually satisfying solution. Dua-dua work together tapi dia tak adalah highlight on each issues uh, addressed by both parties. Okay, the step in the process of compromising conflict communication are as follows. First, we determine the needs of the conflicting parties. We identify the needs of both parties. If everyone has a legitimate a legitimate claim, maksudnya kalau seseorang tu ada claim yang memang sah di sisi undang-undang, we examine the, uh, the outcome to determine whether everyone can receive an equal or fair share of the claim. Okay. Eh? Dia tengok ada possibility tak untuk share claim tu. Benda yang ni. Tak kira lah harta sepencarian and so on. Eh. If dividing the claim works, give everyone involved his or her share of the claim. Settle the case. Ha, kalau dia punya dividing claim tu works, settle the case. Okay. So we are reminded of stereotype depictions of the sibling arguing over inherited property. Uh, ni apa yang kita panggil? Harta apa? Uh, inherited property Allah Akbar. Apa dalam bahasa Melayu dia? Harta pusaka. Uh, perubutan harta pusaka. Okay. So compromising will involve selling the property uh, eh, with the proceed evenly distribute with uh, with the uh, them, they proceed evenly distributed to each of the sibling. Okay. Kalau kita tengok paling senang bila harta pusaka ni Kalau contoh tanah yang kita tak boleh nak pecahkan uh, sebab limited limited uh, size kan sebab limited size kita tak boleh nak pecahkan uh, uh, pecahkan lot tu then therefore probably the sibling decided to sell the property okay and then divide uh, the money tu uh, evenly between all the siblings nah ini contoh compromising semua tak dapat tanah just dapat duit tu pun dapat duit sikit 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 okay Okay, uh, ada uh, uh, ni tak apa nanti you all baca. Okay, this one yang saya nak highlight. Collaborating response. Okay, collaborating response ni it looks similar as compromising but it is actually totally different. Okay. Collaboration it means we using integrative behaviors and developing mutually satisfying agreements to solve the problem once and for all. So meaning that both disputants need sit together to discuss in details regarding the, the alternative that they can use or apply to make sure that both objective, both party objective can be fulfilled. Dua-dua duduk bincang. Untuk tengok uh, apa alternatif yang ada supaya kedua-dua objektif dapat dicapai. Okay, cool. so collaboration has two essential ingredients. First, it consists of integrative behaviour such as cooperation, collective action and mutual assistance. Mesti ada uh, uh, behaviour ni, tingkah laku ni. Cooperative, collective action and mutual assistance. 
Dua-dua pihak kena saling membantu. Okay. When people collaborate, they work together toward the same ends in compatible road. Okay. We call this teamwork. To an observer, the collaborators appear to work side by side and hand in hand. Kena ada kerjasama walaupun dia ada conflicting parties but they work together hand in hand, collaboratively to help each other uh, in terms of information sharing, resource and so on. Okay, so this approach is in direct contrast to opposing or competing individuals who counteract, antagonize and work against one another. Okay, so yang ni ni, collaborate ni, dia totally against, different with uh, uh, competition. The second ingredient is collaboration means that the partners have in mind the same goal. Dua-dua pihak ni, dua-dua pihak berkonflik ni kena ada matlamat yang sama which is to strive for a mutual satisfying solution to the conflict. The end result tu probably will be different from both party. But the target ni make sure the, the two parties ni achieve the satisfying solution. Okay. So mutually satisfying solution are win-win outcome. Sama macam compromising. Okay, tapi compromising ni dia tak dia tak uh, totally win-win tapi dia little win-win little win-win solution eh. So collaboration not only emphasize one's own self interest but also respect the other's interest, needs and goals. Dua-dua kita tengok. So why collaboration may involve confronting differences so it requires a focusing on the problem and includes sharing information about everyone's needs, goals and interests. Nah, ini comparison of conflict resolution approaches. Comparison between competing, avoidance, compromising, accommodating and collaborating. Okay, so you all nanti you all boleh tengok balik kat sini. Okay, ni saya boleh lanjutkan. Okay. As what I said earlier, eh, as much as possible, we want conflict to be handled uh, individually between the disputant through negotiation. Tapi saya tak cover negotiation nanti. Kalau kalau sempat saya share the slide nanti. Okay. Negotiation. Negotiation ni means that the conflict to been settled or been handled by uh, directly by the disputant. Dua pihak. Contohnya kalau tadi pihak uh, jiran kita, kita bergaduh dengan jiran kita berkenaan dengan bunyi bising. Okay. So instead of we post uh, the issue to the social media then therefore we just go directly and discuss with our neighbor on how we can settle the issue and what are the alternative that both of us can think okay for example probably in uh, in what days or in what time then our our neighbor can play uh, a, a loud music dalam dua jam ke tapi during the weekend so probably the uh, uh, neighbor ni kita ni nakkan sedikit uh, uh, sunyi, rasa sunyi sebab nak rehat because during weekend. So it depends on the negotiation between the two disputed. Okay, as much as possible. Itulah itulah cara penyelesaian konflik yang terbaik. Okay, in which kedua-dua pihak cuba untuk berbincang dan mencari alternatif to resolve the conflict. Okay, kalau boleh jangan consider third party dulu bila kita nak resolve the conflict. Jangan guna orang tengah. Tak kira lah uh, konflik tu melibatkan konflik rumah tangga, konflik di tempat kerja between our click and uh, or between uh, apa tu uh, between the click uh, between the subordinate with the supervisor try to discuss directly with the person. That one is the best conflict resolution strategy. Okay? But if let's say the issue couldn't be resolved personally with between the disputants. So therefore we need the third party. Okay, sebab itulah kita perlukan pihak ketiga. Pihak ketiga diperlukan apabila the conflict ni cannot be resolved by those involved in the dispute. Tak boleh dah. Tak boleh nak bincang. Tak boleh nak bersemuka dah. Then therefore, we need the third party. Okay. So, before uh, before the, uh, we proceed with the third party, so we, we, we need to know why the third party agreed to intervene. Ha, sebab kadang-kadang third party ni tak semestinya lawyer, tak semestinya hakim. Dia boleh jadi third party ni adalah ketua JKK kat kalau bahagian kampung kita. Okey, ataupun dia boleh jadi NGO, ataupun dia boleh jadi pegawai yang bekerja di Jabatan Kebajikan Masyarakat. Ataupun kita sendiri uh, bila kita jadi uh, orang ketiga untuk anak-anak kita bergaduh ataupun untuk adik-beradik kita bergaduh, kita jadi orang ketiga. Okey, so kenapa 
individu ni, seseorang individu ni agreed to be the third party, to intervene. Okay, so first one, the first one tendency to gain something. So something ni can be material or social. Dia boleh jadi, bila dia jadi orang tengah, dia dapat imbuhan. Ataupun dia dapat social status. In the form of increased status and reputation, for example. So kalau ketua JKK, dia jadi mediator, dia jadi orang ketiga. Sebab apa? Sebab dia boleh uh, dapatkan, dia increasekan dia punya reputasi sebagai ketua. Okay, so a supervisor who persuade to squabbling subordinates to cooperate benefits from their ability to refocus again on their work. Kalau supervisor, contohnya dia jadi orang ketiga sebab apa? Sebab dia dia akan dapat benefit in terms of productivity, increase in productivity kalau kedua-dua pekerja dapat bekerja dengan baik, bekerjasama dengan baik. So increase productivity. Okay, fixed pay off. Fixed pay off. Contohnya ni, kalau contoh memang Orang yang bekerja sebagai mediator ataupun orang ketiga. So, dia dapat dia dapat salary dia lah. Ha, eh? Okay, so these are the intervention process in general. Okay, so dia akan ada intervener. Dan intervener ni dia akan pakai approach. Approach apa yang dia akan pakai? Ingat balik yang lima tadi. Okay, intervener ni approach apa? Sama macam dalam negotiation eh. So, bila dalam negosiasi pun kita boleh apply ke lima-lima teknik tadi. Sama ada competing, accommodating, compromising, uh, avoiding dan juga collaborating. Kita boleh guna this approach when we negotiate our conflict. Okay, contohnya bila kita discuss dengan suami kita nak balik raya tahun ni. So which technique that we want to apply. Ha, sama dan kita contohnya nak contoh lain bila kita nak apply cuti awal tahun ni. Nak apply cuti raya awal. So what, ta, what negotiation, what techniques that we apply during our negotiation with our clique so that kita boleh tukar shift. Ha, raya pertama ke dan raya kedua saya masuk kerja dan you start raya kedua ketiga, ha, you dapat extra. Ha, contoh, itu adalah negosi negosi negotiation. Okay, so sama juga dalam proses intervention ataupun proses uh, menggunakan pihak ketiga. Okay, kita panggil dia sebagai proses intervensi. Intervener ni dia akan ada approach dia. So approach apa yang kita nak pakai depends on the party, depend on situation. Okay, dan dia disputant pun dia akan ada tingkah laku dia. Disputant ni kedua-dua pihak tu dia akan ada tingkah laku dia sama ada tingkah laku dia ni jenis agresif ataupun pasif. Dua-dua. Kalau agresif ni biasanya yang inferior, eh, superior yang ada kuasa lebih. Pasif ni inferior. Okay, then the outcomes. Okay, the result dia sama ada conflict being resolved or unresolved or intervenous gain or loss. Okay. Okay. Kita tengok third party intervenous. Third party intervenous ni refers to actors who achieve access to the parties and issues and whose manifest intention was to prevent the conflict from escalating. Ha, siapa dia punya, siapa uh, third party ni? Third party ni adalah pihak ke, pihak yang ada akses terhadap uh, parti, terhadap pihak-pihak yang berkonflik dan isu uh, konflik uh, who manifest intention was to prevent. Maksudnya dia punya intention to prevent konflik tu daripada terus berlanjutan. Okay, to intermediary activity undertaken by a third party with the primary intention of achieving some compromise settlement. Okay, so kalau dalam uh, a role of third party ni, dia cuba untuk capai at least compromise settlement. Compromise ni dua-dua dapat small win instead of loss. Okay, of the issues at stake between the parties or at least ending disruptive conflict behavior indulged in by both party. So at least kalau tak dapat pun compromise pun, at least konflik tu, isu tu boleh ditutup. Ha, contohnya bila kita bawa kes ke mahkamah lah eh. Any action taken by an actor that is not a direct party to the crisis that is designed to reduce or remove one or more of the problems of the bargaining relationship and therefore to facilitate the termination of the crisis itself. Ha, so kita boleh relate lah eh. Apa maksud third party ni. Okay. So these are the uh, another term that uh, that can be used interchangeably related to third party. So some other formal and informal third parties internal and external third parties, contractual and emergent third parties, horizontal and vertical third parties. Okay. Okay, ni ada explanation. Nanti you all tengok lah eh. So, sebab saya nak highlight on... Okay. Role of third party. Third party ni dia boleh jadi catalyst, facilitator, 
educator, sounding board, summarizer, translator or interpreter, bridge builder. Tapi dia bukan konflik resolutioner. Dia bukanlah orang yang menyelesaikan konflik. Eh. Dia kata list, facilitate, educate, sounding board, summarize, translate or interpret, bridge builder. Okay, ni ada lagi. Okay, characteristics to be a third party. Third party ni nak, sorry, nak jadi third party ni tak semestinya kita ada formal education. Eh, tak semestinya. Tapi it, it, this must be a skilled scholar or practitioner whose background, attitude, behavior and gender impartiality. Okay, a skilled scholar, practitioner whose background, attitude, behavior ni and gender impartiality. So this element of impartiality is very crucial principle to become a third party. Third, bila kita sebut third party je, dia mestilah seorang yang boleh mengaplikasikan impartiality ni. And whose professional knowledge and expertise enable the facilitation of productive confrontation. Okay, they should have moderate knowledge of the parties. Tak semestinya ada uh, a, a, a good knowledge. Eh? Moderate knowledge. Uh, moderate knowledge pun cukup dah. Related to the parties, low power over them and high control over consultation situation. Okay, low, uh, uh, apa tu? High control meaning that dia ada knowledge untuk control the consultation process, the uh, intervention process. Okay. Ini ciri-ciri uh, third party. Okay. Types of conflict resolution. Nah, ini secara umumnya. Secara umumnya dia ada lima teknik, lima conflict resolution yang kita boleh pakai. Direct negotiation ni yang saya discuss tadi, yang saya bagi tahu tadi. As much as possible, we want the conflict to be resolved directly between the disputed. But if it is uh, it is not possible, then therefore we have to consider the third party. Okay, so when we consider the third party, there are few types of third party conflict resolution. So, kita ada conciliation, mediation, arbitration and litigation. Okay, conciliation, mediation, arbitration and litigation. Okay, nanti kita akan tengok secara detail lagi lah apa maksud keempat-empat ni. Saya rasa lagi empat minit saya stop. Okay, okay. so saya explain sampai sini je. Okay, so from the left to the right side ni, from direct negotiation to litigation ni, we can see the decrease in power of the individual. Kalau kita tengok eh, dalam direct negotiation ni, both party has a very huge power to express the needs, their needs and demand. Ni. Sebab kita memang directly discuss kita punya konflik. So kita boleh express apa sahaja yang kita suka dan kita tak suka. Tapi bila semakin masuk, semakin ke depan, start with conciliation, mediation, arbitration and litigation, hak kita, kuasa kita semakin berkurang. Particularly when you proceed at litigation. Uh, you have no power that actually. It depends on the law. Law control the, the cause and consequences. Okay. And then in terms of level of coercion, they negatively correlated with individual power. Semakin kurang individual power, semakin tinggi level of coercion. Either you like it or not, you have to accept the decision made by the court. Itu maksud dia coercion. Kita terpaksa menerima keputusan tu. Sedangkan kalau kita ada kuasa, kuasa yang tinggi untuk negotiate our conflict, kita akan kita akan rasa kurang terpaksa untuk menerima keputusan orang lain. Itu maksudnya. Eh? And then, uh, kita bila kita tengok importance of relationship pun, dia akan reduce from the left to right side. Kalau kita directly negotiate our conflict, we still can maintain long-term relationship with our partners or with our neighbors or with our opponent. Tapi bila kita proceed until litigation, the tendency to maintain the the relationship ni will be less. Mula jadi kita takkan bercakap with that person sehingga kita mati. Huh? Due to, uh, itu dia punya consequence of uh, each consequences of each teknik. Okay, yang ni memang tak sempat dah. Sebab saya akan saya nak tunjuk video for each session ni. So dia memang tak sempat. Okay, so tak apa. So, I thought I stop here for today, for today's session. InsyaAllah we will proceed Uh, starting from conciliation in in our next session. 
Tapi at least you have you have the idea apa itu negotiation and then what 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 does it mean by third party. So by the way, is there any question for uh, for uh, apa tu so far? Ada soalan tak? Dia sikit lagi slide tak banyak. Cuma dalam setiap uh, setiap section ni dia ada video yang saya nak tunjukkan so that you can see the differences between uh, all these techniques. Ada soalan tak nak tanya? Ke dah mengantuk dah doktor panjang sangatlah hari ni. Ha, ni ada lagi ni lagi. 8 jam apa 6 jam lagi eh. 6 jam lagi. Hmm. Any question so far guys? Any question related to your assignment? Tak ada doktor. Tak ada. So, bukan tak ada. Uh, belum lagi doktor. Uh, belum lagi. It's okay. Uh, so then uh, if there is no more questions so we stop here. I give you another 10 minutes to at least uh, rehatkan kejap before you continue with another session with the next session. So insyaAllah we will see each other in the next session. Uh, in the next session. So before that I would like to wish Selamat Hari Raya to those who celebrate it. Selamat Hari Raya, Selamat Berpuasa and then happy holidays who, who will enjoy the holiday. Same to us eh. Uh, so thank you so much guys. So take care. InsyaAllah see you next time eh. Assalamualaikum. Thank you doctor. Thank you. Selamat Hari Raya. Selamat Hari Raya.